This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. <clears throat> some virus uh, was to affect a student or staff person in our district. Uh, so we're actively partnering with the town on that and more soon. It's an evolving situation for sure. Um, and one of the things that we're continuing to stress is this is one of the worst flu seasons uh, that Massachusetts has ever had. And that is affecting our schools pretty significantly, both of the staff and the student end. And the same types of things that one would do to prevent the flu in terms of uh, hand washing for 20 seconds with soap, um, avoiding some physical contact, hard to do with young kids, but uh, we do the best we can, uh, making sure our cleaning protocols are up to date, and, and we updated them last year, and based on guidance we received from DPH, we're uh, continuing to update those. Uh, those are the best things that we can do in terms of a preventative approach, uh, and that's the way we're, we're sort of approaching this, that we're going to do everything we can in terms of prevention, but also develop a plan for uh, an unfortunate scenario if it was to occur locally. So I think by the time of the next regional meeting, which is next Tuesday, uh, I'll be able to be, uh, either me or Ms. Consolino, be able to be much more clear uh, on our approach and plan. But as the situation evolves and the town, for instance, got information this afternoon from the state, uh, we want to make sure that we have uh, a concise, clear plan uh, before we share anything with the, the general public. But uh, the preventative approach is already in place. I think the other update I'd like to make very briefly is that uh, Mr. Demling uh, talked about Mr. Nakajima. One of the things with his departure uh, was that uh, in my illness I, I, uh, last week, because it's been going on a while, I, I thought about uh, that it'd be nice to have him as chair of the region and Ms. Ardones as chair of the Amherst Elementary Schools be able to, chance to have a chance to reflect on their tenures. And so uh, I was feeling better on Friday before I backslid. Got more information than you need to know, but we were able to tape a window into ARP's episode where for half an hour they, you know, reflect on their three and a half years of experience, Anastasia, a little more uh, on the Amherst and Regional School Committee. So that'll be up tomorrow. And I think it's a really good reflection for people who are interested in what is it like to be a school committee member, what are some of the benefits and what are some of the challenges. I think they really captured the experience very clearly of what does it mean to be a chair, what does it mean to be a committee member, uh, and what are the rewarding parts of that position, those positions. So um, be on the lookout for that one, but I think it'll be something that, um, you know, for seeing your former colleagues, uh, I, th I think it, it came out really well. And thank you to Amherst Media for covering that on short notice. Thank you. So um, before we move on to the agenda, I do want to um, uh, talk about uh, rearranging some of the order of, the, of tonight's agenda to accommodate Dr. Morris calling in. Um, so we will proceed um, with A, the budget hearing. Um, and then be before going on to the second quarter budget update, I'd like to go into the school choice hearing. And then from there, move up item J, dual language lottery to right after school choice hearing. And then from there, continue on to the second quarter budget update. Is that, yes, Mr. Denley? I, th I think the only possible complication there is if somebody was planning to come to the, the school choice hearing, it's on the agenda for 7.15. And so if they got here mm. at 7 or 7.10 and they found it was already over. Um, that might feel uh, less than ideal. So, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with, with starting it. And then, um, I don't know, uh, maybe, so I guess there's two options. One, we could do the non-hearing items. And then um, once it's 7.15, do the school choice hearing. Maybe mm -hmm. that's simplest. Uh, or we could do the school choice hearing. And then if someone comes later and says, hey, I'm here at 7.15, I'd like to provide my input, we could allow that. Um, you know, whichever, what do you, whatever yeah. you think. Yeah. I, uh, so, <laughs> yes? Could I suggest maybe an alternative? Because um, I think Mr. Demling's spot on. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we did the budget hearing and then the dual language lottery uh, and then the school choice hearing, we might find ourselves at 715 anyway. I was thinking along the same line. So, yes. Okay. Does that sound good to Ms. Spitzer, you had another? 
I was going to make the same suggestion okay. as Dr. Morris. Okay, so we will go budget hearing, then do a language lottery, and then school choice hearing. And then also leave open the possibility that if it is before 7.15 and members of the community come in at 7.15 wanting to speak to the school choice hearing, we will um, reopen that uh, comment period. Okay. Okay. So, Mr. Slaughter. All right. So, um, I'm going to take a moment here to open up my slide deck. Uh, this is still dated the 26th of February because I didn't change it for the shift from last week to this week. Um, in general, however, the, this series of slides is not wildly different than what you've seen previously. Uh, when we get to the sort of ads and cuts section, uh, Dr. Morris will join us in, in more detail as far as what those, those things uh, are looking like at this point in our, in our process. Um, and so we're at the budget hearing. Uh, some, some basic budget highlights. Uh, our proposed budget is $24,506,342. Uh, this includes some additions of $208,341, some, some adjustments of, of negative $383,000, and there are no reductions in this, in this budget. So the adjustments are financially good as far as reducing our, our, uh, our, ex our, our expenditure, but, but they're not necessarily causing any reductions in, in what we're trying to offer to the, to the students. And so we're we're maintaining the things we've been doing, um, you know, high quality dedicated staff and in community and school programs and our class sizes, et cetera. Uh, and then we're able to make uh, some investments in some new things and some continuing programs that we have, like the dual language program, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, there's some infrastructure planning we're doing around um, uh, new buildings, uh, some professional development for paraeducators and the like. Uh, and so you can see that from the slide. And most of those things were, were covered in our previous uh, uh, meetings. Uh, the budget timeline, which uh, really has changed, uh, the third one, the public hearing and presentation of detailed additions and reductions, which is for tonight, which is now March 2nd instead of February 26th. But otherwise, we're, we're well on our way through the budget process. And, and when you meet again on, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, the 17th of March, you'll actually uh, be, be asked to take a vote on, the, on that on the budget. Uh, but tonight we'll hear from, from you all and others about, about this budget. Uh, but the other things that are on this slide tell us about the, the, the dictates of, of the town charter, and so the manager will need to, to uh, receive the budget from you all by the 1st of April. He's got to get it to the council for the 1st of May, and then they will take action after that. Um, and again, just, uh, just for the public at large, the, the budget process, we start in early uh, early in the fiscal year, really at the end of the first quarter, uh, start in October to December, we start having conversations about uh, what things are looking like for the new year, what kinds of programming and, and the like we'd like to do uh, and we need to do and, and start to think about what those things cost and how things need to be adjusted. Um, when we get into J December and January, we, we get some initial guidance on what the financial uh, revenues look like from the state. We, we make some predictions on that. Uh, we get some feedback from the town as far as uh, how that shapes and influences our budget. Um, and then we continue to have those meetings with uh, directors, principals, and, and look to see if what they wanted to do when there was no constraint in October to December, and now that we have some sort of sense of, of things, how those fit together. Um, and then we keep going in, in, in that way and an iterative process until we come to, to tonight's meeting where we, we present a budget in a more detailed way to you all and then and then have a little time uh, between now and your next meeting when when you'll actually vote to to propose a budget to the to the council so the expense budget um, this is the sort of simplified version of things and and so our salaries and our substitutes uh, somewhat significant increase in substitutes primarily driven by changes in in the minimum wage um, and so that's about a five percent increase on on that number from fiscal 20 to 21. Um, overall, you'll see a 2.8% increase. That's the, the percentage at the bottom of the next to last column. Um, and that was within guidance of, of, uh, of what was uh, asked of us from the, from the town as far as what they knew of, of uh, revenue estimates for the coming year. And, and so we, we kept within that. Um, you know, the overall change in level services is 3.45%, but we had some reductions by virtue of the 154, 659, which you see there, 
which is that combination of, of adjustments to the budget, and we'll, we'll get into those in more detail in a, in a moment, and then uh, some, some additions to some, some programming and some, and some things uh, which we'll detail in a few, in a few moments, but an overall, uh, you know, that helps to reduce the, uh, the overall impact of the changes to provide level services. Um, just to talk about the expense budget a little bit, the salaries, all but the uh, food service budget is, is uh, still in the, in the collective bargaining agreement. They're, they're in effect for another year. Uh, so a 2% COLA across the board and then steps for, for folks that are not at the top uh, are in the 2 to 6% range for those, those folks. Um, with the minimum wage changing and, and, and again next year it will go up, uh, this year went up 25 cents in January, it goes up 75 cents next January, so that will have an, an, an impact on things and so we've, we've tried to capture that in, in some of our budgeting for the substitutes. Um, and you'll see in our expense account, special education uh, contracted services significantly higher. We had a, some influx and when we talk second quarter report, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit about change in some of the demographics of our student population and that's driving a bit of a need there in contracted services. Um, but another thing to keep in mind is health insurance, which had a very, very modest 1.89%, uh, uh, still contributes about 20% of the increase in expense accounts as a whole. So it's a, it's a huge driver of, of, uh, of our budget. And so I wanted to point that out to you all as, as we move ahead. Um, and so now we'll move to the, the next slide, which is the additions and reductions. And I'll, I'll ask Dr. Morris to, to speak to the particulars of, of this slide. Sure. Thank you. Um, the only thing I want to add before I talk additions and reductions is that the, um, this budget fits within the fin finance committee guidance that they gave to us in the fall. So uh, that might be under, you know, just assumed, but I just wanted to be explicit about that. Um, so in terms of budget adjustments, uh, you'll see special education tuition. Occasionally there's a student with special needs from a neighboring town who would benefit from one of our specialized programs. And if there's space and the fit is right, uh, we have on occasion accepted students into one of our specialized programs, particularly if they're gonna be with us in our regional district anyway. It's, it's in everyone's best interest to get students the services they need. And so we charge tuition for that. It's not uh, through the, um, purely through goodwill. And so that's an adjustment to the positive uh, tuition payment that we anticipate to be $50,000. Um, sabbatical, so as you may remember, last year we had a sabbatical that was accepted. You voted to accept one. Um, there were no requests this year, so that is a, a positive to the budget that there's no sabbaticals this year. Um, we, you have put in now uh, $150,000 into a special ed stabilization fund. Um, so we feel like that's sufficient. So it's reducing, uh, last year we had that as a budget number $50,000 contribution. We're reducing that because we feel like that's a sufficient number. Uh, we feel like uh, particularly when we get to UMass strategic partnership agreement, I can talk a little more about it, but even with some of the variants that we've had, we feel confident that we could prepay some retirement incentives out of this year's budget, which will help next year's budget. And um, the school committee shifts school committee stipend payments to the town. So this eliminates uh, the payments that school committee members receive, stipends they receive uh, as per the charter from the school budget to the town budget, which everyone, including our legal counsel, feels like is a lot cleaner than the current, um, current model. And um, UMass strategic partnership agreement. So UMass has agreed uh, starting in this fiscal year and the two fiscal years after to give $185,000 to the districts. Uh, and the way we roughly split that out is 170 to the Amherst Elementary District and $15,000 to the region based on the kind of average, historic average percentage of kids um, in tax exempt housing who attend our elementary district versus our secondary district. Uh, as North Village is now going through some pretty significant changes, you know, the current numbers aren't particularly helpful, but we went backwards and, and we feel like that's a fair assessment um, uh, and benefit. And it's, uh, I, I don't want to minimize the point that this has been a discussion for many, many years. The committee has been heavily involved the last two or three years with the Donahue Institute report. And this is making a significant difference in our budget. You can see that it's roughly three teacher salaries that are being paid for. So when we talk about budget additions, uh, we wouldn't be having that conversation if we didn't have uh, the funds coming in from the UMass Strategic Partnership Agreement. And thank you to the town as well for assisting in that discussion. Uh, and the last one on adjustments is we're looking at preschool and 
Um, preschool, uh, to make a, a sort of lengthy story short, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, is um, sort of analogous to Summit Academy in many ways. Uh, and much like Summit Academy, we feel like the preschool requires an administrator, not a kind of teacher level coordinator to support the staff and students in that. So it's not a huge price difference, um, you know, price point on there. Uh, that's, it depends on the person's salary when they get hired and, and a whole variety of other things, but it's providing more administrative and, and frankly, mental health support for the preschool staff. So those are the adjustments. And why don't I pause before I talk about additions, see if there are questions. So I, I just had a quick question. Um, maybe it's not so quick, but on the um, UMass Strategic Partnership Agreement, I find this, this notation a little bit confusing because it makes it look like we're reducing our spending by this amount, as opposed because if I read that correctly, or am I just misreading? <laughs> as opposed to it's an increase in revenue. So. Let, I'll let uh, Dr. Slaughter answer that one. <laughs> sure. So it, it's showing as a negative number because it reduces the expenses. And so we're talking about expenses generally when we're looking at these additions and reductions. And so to, to just be consistent with that, it is additional income, but income in this type of format does show up as a negative number. So parentheses are good as far as uh, uh, from the standpoint of, of cost. So it's lowering our cost or our appropriated amount of money. Thank you. Any other questions on this? Okay. Okay. Um, so for additions, we have a modest addition. Um, so after we got the positive news in December about getting it back in the MSBA process, I went to all three of the schools and we talked about how to engage um, teachers, in particular teachers and paraeducators. Um, in the process, and one of the ideas that came from the group that came to these meetings was, uh, or one of the concepts was, you know, being on the building committee is an incredible amount of time, energy, um, and some of that work sort of uh, having lived through it before has a lot to do with education, and some of it, you know, frankly doesn't. Um, and so the idea was if there was a, a group of you know, roughly 10 staff members who are stipended to meet, you know, once a month, perhaps slightly more often if things are heating up in a certain way where we want educators' voices involved, um, they could then inform and offer feedback to the MSBA, the school building committee, as well as serve as a communication tool back to the staff. And I think one of the things as we enter this MSBA process that I think everyone agrees is we want to really hone in on the best communication strategy and uh, I appreciate staff for coming up with this idea because I think it has high, uh, high I think it has a high potential to keep staff engaged and hearing from each other as opposed to always from administration I think has a real real positive benefit um, and there was broad you know strong interest in if we set something up like this uh, in participating in it um, so that's the idea of that one uh, um, so the next one, sixth grade to the middle school exploration is a rather small amount of money, but it's uh, for some staff members who don't typically work in the summer to spend some time working in the summer to fine tune uh, a model around what sixth grade to the middle school could look like. Um, the next one down is uh, really around the opportunity gap or educational debt. And this is having a middle school math teacher come down and work with groups uh, who are underrepresented in honors and AP and flex math courses in our middle school and high school and work with fifth and particularly with sixth graders to get them on track so that when they get to seventh grade, they opt into flex and are successful in flex. One of the things, the more as we've looked at this whole sixth grade and the middle school question that's come up is waiting till kids get to the middle school to do some of the intervention is, is really too late. And having someone who knows what the flex curriculum is and can be both uh, help with the math and fill in any gaps kids may have um, that would prevent them from being successful, but also having some uh, motivational uh, support uh, we feel like is really important. And, you know, we're not pleased with the demographics. They're not representative 
of our general population, particularly in mathematics. And this is um, trying to do something uh, a bit different. Um, and our elementary principals on board, it'll take some complicated scheduling, but we feel like that we have that worked out. And paraeducator training. So this is uh, supporting paraeducators who uh, often work with students with disabilities um, to make sure they have the skills they need. Uh, we do have what's called safety care training, but uh, one of the things we recognize is that we need to provide additional training for paraeducators, particularly in the specialized programs of Building Blocks, AIMS, and the ILC, uh, as well as the preschool uh, who work with students who have more significant disabilities. Um, contingency control accounts, uh, this is a, a sort of a delicate one to talk about, but we sometimes have situations when we get to March where we're unclear whether a student can remain in the district and successfully access the curriculum or will need to go to an out-of-district placement. And so this is setting a contingency because we aren't sure if we uh, will need to use that. Uh, Dr. Morris? Oh, yes. You, uh, you went out, uh, you cycled out a little bit after explaining the contingency control accounts. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I think what I was just trying to say is that we try to really only use the stabilization fund in, in a real emergency if we can maintain it through our operating budget and um, not create structure uh, by using the stabilization. We try to do that. Um, yeah. Are you? Do uh, the wellness of our staff, and we are uh, encouraging them. There's a nice model that. We, um, you keep going out, Dr. Morris, I don't know if something's changed in where you're situated, but you, you keep going in and out. Is this any clearer? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so, um, I think yeah, we lost so you at staff wellness. Yeah, sorry about that. So for staff wellness, just that um, we'd like to form a committee with the Teachers Association uh, around this topic. We know uh, a well staff um, is going to be at their best and, and staff where wellness is not the priority um, has all sorts of negative consequences for our students. Um, special ed clerical. So right now Wildwood has a part time special ed clerical person, whereas the other two schools have full time and that's based on caseloads. But uh, what we realized is that um, we're paying a lot of overtime for the Wildwood clerical person because the numbers have went up. And we used to have a full-time special ed clerical at all three schools, and we're recognizing that we really need to – that was a budget cut uh, a couple years ago, and we need to kind of get back to that model um, so we can support our students and families with special ed needs. Um, facility sustainability support, this is working with the town. Um, to contract out some analysis of how we can become more green over time. And again, we feel like this, these funds should pay for themselves, that uh, we should be able to make sustainability improvements over time uh, with an expert in the area working with our facilities team. The second to last one is, uh, again, we've had a positive financial year. And uh, as we look forward, and the UMass piece and the health insurance are two you know, huge variables. Um, this spring, we're doing an uh, English language arts review of our curriculum. And uh, this is based on kind of achievement data as well as feedback from staff. And what we found out with the math is that once you do a review, then you have to implement changes. And it's worked really well to have a teacher leader in that position. And we're hoping that that person also can support us with looking at the sixth grade study uh, and some of that work as well. Um, so we're looking at this as a one-year position that we can fade uh, as we head to next year in the same way we did with the mathematics because that's been a very effective implementation methodology. And the last one is three paraeducators, and that's based just on student needs, which Mr. Slaughter will um, talk a little bit about when he does second quarter budget. And I think that's all I have to share um, and open to any questions people might have. Mr. Demley? 
Um, yeah, so I, I see some of the public has arrived. So are we, do you want, I'm just asking the chair, do you want the committee to ask questions now and then at the end we'll open up for public questions? How do you want to? That, that was my plan, if that works. Okay, yeah, so um, brief, brief clarifying questions right now. Right, yeah. okay. Um, so yeah, so just, just a brief clarifying on the, the one-year position ELA review and sixth grade study. So with, with both of those tasks in that one-year position, can, can you just talk a little bit more, is this, is this primarily for ELA review and, and you're hoping that, that they can assist with the sixth grade study or is it a 50-50? Split, you just talk about like what the FTE expectations are for that position. Sure, yeah, I wouldn't say it's 50-50. I think the ELA will be the larger task. Uh, we're not necessarily looking at early literacy and phonics. We did that work over the last couple of years. It's much more looking at middle to upper grades. So the scope is not the same as, uh, as it was with mathematics. And so I do think there's, uh, there's scalability um, to go down from what was required for grades six through 12 and in you know, lots of different buildings. Um, so I would say like probably two thirds ELA review and, and one third sixth grade study. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from the committee? Ms. Spitzer? Um, I just wanted to clarify with the, the stipends. Um, those are exclusively for school staff that wouldn't be going to other members of the MSBA um, committees that will be formed throughout the process. Yeah, no, it, it's, yeah, uh, no, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that and maybe when my phone was going in and out. Um, no, this is exclusively for um, teachers, paraeducators, and clerical staff to be, you know, engaged and have their uh, thoughts taken into account as well as for them to be able to communicate it back with their colleagues. And I just have one um, other clarifying question on the um, support for increased participation in flex and honors from underrepresented yep. groups. Is that specifically with regard to math participation or in general? It is specifically to math. Yeah, I'm sorry, that should have been more clear actually in the text. Yeah, yeah um, you know, um, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, so I think we have one more slide before, we'll, we'll go through one more slide before we open up for the hearing portion. Of Right, so this slide is, is uh, just talking about some of the other funds that support our budgets that, that help us to do the work that we do. Um, we, we have a quick grant summary here. I'm not sure I've captured absolutely everything under Amherst Education Foundation. There's uh, grant applications were due recently, and so I'm not sure if we've captured all of the fiscal 20 or not there. Uh, but you see the other grants that support the work that we do. Generally speaking, most of these are uh, augmentative to what we do, not entirely, but, but a lot of them are. Um, and so they're in addition to what our, our base, and, and require us to have it be supplementary to what we do. Um, not extensively or exclusively, but many, many of them are. Um, and then under the revolving funds, those are ones where we, where we have, um, you know, a dedicated purpose funds is what they are. They allow, the state allows us to have those kinds of dedicated purpose funds that help us to uh, mitigate extremes in our budgets is, is one way to think of it. Um, but it also helps us to sort of build balances for good and bad years, like in food service, we're trying to build a balance there so we can hold and sustain our program in a way we'd like. Um, but under things like school choice, there's years we need more support from that, and other years we don't need as much support from that. Um, likewise with circuit breaker special education, those are again trying to uh, help build in some uh, capacity to, to uh, deal with contingencies uh, that come up and, and, and arise in, in our budget. Um, and so, you know, those, those accounts are, we're trying to uh, maintain the balance in a, in a fairly steady way. So it's, it's, you know, in a sense, rainy day funds in some circumstances, not exclusively, but, but in others, uh, it's for regular supportive programming. Uh, school choice, we use some of that money every year. Um, but we don't want to take too much so that we don't have it when we need it in a more extreme circumstance. We've got a fortunate budget year this year where we've got a fairly positive uh, outcome, so we'll be touching those as lightly as we can, um, is the idea. And so that's, that's really the last thing I want to share with you in that regard, and then we'll take questions <coughs> as you may wish to, to see if the public had comment or questions as well. Mr. Demley. Um, Dr. Slaughter, where would you put Charter school tuition out expenses, um, current and projected, how that affects the budget. I, I mean, I, I understand the accounting for that gets complicated with the town, but um, how, does that, how does that fit into this overview picture? So what happens is that for the, uh, 
for the town and for the elementary budget in particular, what happens is those assessments, both positive and negative, are all accounted for sort of before it ever gets to us. And so when the town comes to us and says, we think you can have a 2.8% increase, it factors in the expectations on the charge tuitions out and any uh, revenues in uh, relative to that. And so those are kind of taken into account before it, it gets to us. So it's kind of a bit, this presentation and generally our budget is a bit blind to that. Um, whereas on the regional side, as you know, is, it's a little more straightforward because it's, it's literally a number we can, can, can you know, identify for ourselves. Um, but on the, on the town side, it's blended in with a lot of other pluses and minuses that have nothing to do with schools. So it's, it's, it's uh, part and parcel of the cherry sheet. Um, and so it doesn't really show up here. Mr. Demling? Uh, um, so if, if maybe at our next meeting, Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter, if we get like a more detailed presentation of how that has changed from last year. Because um, I, I know how the accounting has been done with the town and with the schools has, has changed a little bit over time in terms of uh, accounting for that first and then having that impact the, uh, the allocation that the schools get or, or not. And, and with, the, with the change in the charter reimbursement law um, uh, and, and with, with uh, how volatile it can be year to year, I just think it would be helpful f uh, for the overall budget picture to understand how that's working in context. Absolutely. There's no other questions from the committee. Then we'll move on to the public comment hearing portion of the, sorry, the public comment portion of the hearing. Um, and just to uh, describe our process um, for this is uh, we have some members of the community who are here. Thank you for coming. Um, each uh, individual, similar to our public comment period, will have three minutes to, um, to prepare, to present their input, feedback, or questions. Um, and we'll go through um, every, every, every comment um, at that point. And then at the conclusion of the public comment, um, the uh, superintendent and Mr. Slaughter will have an opportunity to respond um, to those questions and, um, and provide clarification there. Um, and if there's any sort of clarifying questions from the committee, then we can circle back on that as well. So um, with that, if you have um, comments that you'd like to please identify yourself when you Hi, uh, Tony Cunningham, and uh, I sent through a bunch of questions I had ahead of time just to give advance notice since I had a lot, and I don't think I'm going to fit them in three minutes, so I don't know how you want me to do it. Do you want me to just read through the list of questions and then see how many I can read in three minutes and then they're addressed, or how should this be approached? I, that, I would do that, yep. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I looked at the DESI data on uh, per pupil spending, and Amherst is spending about $5,000 more per pupil than our neighboring districts. And I was wondering what, why is that, and what is Amherst getting for the additional $5,000 per pupil? Um, <clears throat> on page five of the budget, it has special education and regular education spending and they're very similar. There's only a percentage point between them, but I understand that special ed services much fewer students, so I was just wondering for an explanation for that. Similarly, the expense accounts are almost, well, they're not the same, but there's 268,000 in special ed expense accounts, 376 in regular, but again, they service a significantly different number of students, so just an explanation of that. Um, Central administration expense accounts seem to be six times the school administration expense accounts. Just wondering why that is and what those funds are spent on. Um, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of the meeting, so some of these things may have been addressed. And the bro it wasn't broadcasting on Amherst Media, so I wasn't able to watch the first half hour. Um, <clears throat> there's this special education contingency control accounts, $49,451. I was wondering what that is. Um, I know in the January meeting, um, the superintendent said it was to do with students coming into the district after the beginning of the year and needing special ed services, but I thought that's what the stabilization fund was for, so just curious what that additional figure is for. Um, the, uh, on page 68 of the budget, under central administration school committee, there's a $16,000 charge or amount for other unclassified expense. Just wondering what that is. Um, on page 80, the Amherst Elementary School bus routes are, have gone up $50,000 in two years. 
Just wondering why that could be, or at least the proposed budget is 50,000 more than the actual was two years ago. Um, transportation maintenance staff's gone up by $30,000, wondering why that is. Um, on page 84, contingency expense accounts totaling 217,000. Two years ago, they were $1,000. So I'm just wondering why there's now $100,000 for payroll adjustments, 66,000 for grant changes, and so on. Um, I think Mr. Demling just addressed my question about where in the budget you would see how much is going out for charter school um, funding, because I wasn't able to figure that out, other than looking at the number of students and then multiplying it by the per pupil cost and just what's the net um, school choice similarly, what's the net of school choice? Um, it looks like there's 24 students going out and 88 coming in or some numbers it looks like 100 coming in. Um, so what's the net on that to the district? Um, I didn't see any funding for early childhood access per the recommendations from Kristen Hayes in the study that she did a few weeks ago. Um, I was wondering why that's not in there and what the plan is for that. Um, and then in the quarter two budget, it showed district-wide uh, special education and support significantly over budget. And it explains why that is and how it's going to be covered out of the UMass funds and a few other things. And I'm just curious why the special education stabilization fund is not being applied first since I thought that was what its purpose was for, um, unanticipated costs. And then should I address capital now or no? Is that separate? We don't actually have a capital hearing. Um, okay. It would, that would be general public comment. Um, Which I missed, right? The, um, so we haven't, we haven't actually okay. had that presentation yet. Is so. there a hearing on that coming up or? There is not a, a hearing, hearing, but there yeah. is um, a public comment at our next meeting. Okay, because I know it's in the packet for tonight, so that's why I was curious. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I had a couple other questions about the additions, and I think Dr. Morris addressed it just when I walked in the door there. The, the ELA review and sixth grade study position, um, he was explaining why that's needed. I was just curious about that. And uh, the middle school, um, sixth grade to the middle school exploration, I noticed the amount dropped from 7,000 in January to 3,000 today. Um, which I think is a good thing, but I'm wondering why we should be spending that money at all and how much did the work over the last 10 months cost? How much did we pay Juan Rodriguez? And were we paying district staff to participate in the grade span advisory board? I don't know. And if we were, how much was it and where do we see that in the budget? I couldn't find that. Um, and then the, lastly, I'll just say the stipends for the MSBA steering group. Um, I just was curious why educators should be paid to do that. It seems like it should be a voluntary role um, that I'm just wondering if other districts pay their teachers to participate in a steering group and if that was done for the Wildwood Project. Um, and how would you select who would get that? How would those teachers be selected um, to receive the stipend? And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, that was a lot. So I'd be, before you start timing me, um, I wasn't aware in our, in our last meeting that there was a, a limitation during hearings for people to speak for the public. So we're, is that like policy? Yes. OK, because that wasn't explained at the last meeting. So anyway, so um, I want to thank the parent, parent right? Yeah for some of those things that you brought up, because I think one of the things that I just want to, I'm, I'm not going to get into too many details about the, I didn't come in with that kind of information. Um, can you please identify? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm Caridad Martinez, and I am a member of the School Committee Equity Task Force. And um, so my concerns are around um, not being able to fully understand the budget. So I, this is, I, I said it at the last meeting, I think that the school committee and the administration need to work on being able to present a budget, right, and how schools spend their monies in a way that's comprehensive, understandable to the general public. I don't think that that's, I think that this is language and thing, you know, and uh, language that is used that is only understandable to certain people and other people just, 
you know, we gotta try to figure it out or come here in three minutes and ask questions that are not gonna be answered in three minutes. So I think what I'd like to say uh, is more of a statement. So um, we all know that public education is funded mostly through property taxation, which we already know causes inequality in access to resources and outcome, and this district benefits due to property taxation more than others. And um, one of the things that I'm concerned is um, with what seems, according to much more detailed information that's recently been made available to the public through other means that isn't the school committee, that for me, that there's an unequal and unfair allocation and distribution of wealth in the ARPS system. Um, an example that I'll give you is there seems to be a very wide discrepancy between paraprofessional salaries and teacher salaries, though para paraeducators work just as hard as many teachers, and most of them are presently people of color, while teachers with the higher salaries, higher salaries are mostly white. So I think that's something that we should look at. Um, it seems that more money is spent on salaries and direct services to adults, meaning teachers and administrative staff and other staff, than money directly allocated to students. Is this true? I'm going by information that has been presented to the public by other means, right? And by um, some of the understanding that I, I try to have by reading these documents. Um, is this true? If so, how are you going to change that? Because in fact, that shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way, should it? It also seems that certain individuals have more than one title and are being paid extra salaries for these jobs. Once again, this information is coming from other information that's been made public. I think this needs to be looked at to see if these people are being overpaid. Can these jobs be consolidated? Are these people being evaluated? Is this practice even legal? Another issue is that it appears that salaries are being increased without people being evaluated. Is this legal? Is it right? Is it true? Are teachers, administrators, and other staff being evaluated according to policy, which means consistently and whenever a pay raise is being, is being considered, people should be evaluated? Is that happening? Do we, do we know if that's happening? Or are these um, salary raises just happening and people aren't being evaluated? I think it's a responsibility of the school committee and the administration to rethink the allocation and distribution and to review these concerns that the community is bringing up. I also think that this school committee should be reviewing in detail how money is spent, in detail. Um, you should all be thinking of creating a way, I already said this, you know, to create a way in which the budget is clear and understandable to the general public. I would like to be able to know exactly what a line item means if it's not obvious, and how the money is being exactly spent. If not maybe in the moment, we won't know until the end of the year, there may be like a general fund and then at the end of the year we'll know exactly how it was spent, but at least we have an idea. What exactly do these things mean? So when you say a contingency plan, well what does that really mean, right, in detail? What does that mean? Um, and I think that if you're going to be cutting anything, you should be cutting trips, food, and legally supported uh, uh, and unsupported salary increases, meaning if the people are not being evaluated, nobody should be getting a raise. That's ridiculous. And if that's happening, that's not correct, right? There should be a proper evaluation uh, um, policy and that should be um, you know, practiced as it should be. And so the other um, thing that I wanna say is um, uh, about what I saw up here, which unfortunately, we don't have any hard copies in this meeting, so I, um, but in the area that said reductions, and um, if we can go back to that just really quickly, if somebody can get me back to that page where there's reductions, and thank you. There we go. Additions and reductions. So someone pointed out that it looked like the UMass Strategic Partnership Agreement looked like it was money that was being reduced but in fact, it's something else. I wasn't clear on that. So when I look at this and I see something in parentheses, according to the legend, it means reductions. I mean, so it's, it's not clear to me, you know, if it's, are you, is this a reduction in the budget? You know, what does that really mean? Because I didn't really understand what you said. And um, so that makes it, you know, uncomprehensible. So, and so uh, then I would go back and then I'll wrap it up to, so in fact, special education 
um, tuition, so we have it in parentheses, is that a reduction? Right, so I'm not clear. You know, does that mean that you're cutting from the budget this amount of money in relation to um, special education, right? In relation to um, the stabilization fund contribution special ed, and I'm, confu and I'm a little concerned with cutting anything from special ed, unless, of course, it's money that's not being spent the way it's supposed to be. Because I actually, from my experience, is advocating for children who are on IEPs in this district many parents who do not know about the various resources that are available to children, their children do not have access to those resources. Usually it's parents that are very well informed, who have legal representation, whose children get the resources that they require to show academic progress, right, to have academic progress. So, um, I'm concerned that if a parent comes in and says, I'd like a par I think a paraprofessional would be a good fit for my child, and that the special education person says, we don't have the money for that. Well, yeah, you don't have the money for that if you're cutting. Is that what that means, right? So thank you. Thank you. So, any further comments from the committee? So, um, uh, Dr. Morris or Mr. Slaughter, would you, do you have any follow-on comments or clarifications? I'll defer to Dr. Morris to start. Any, I'll defer to Dr. Morris uh, to start. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, in terms of per pupil costs, um, there's two primary factors of uh, comparisons to other neighboring districts. One is how many adults we have working with kids, and the second is uh, what the salary scale are. And I think that's what uh, one of the members of the public said is true, that you know we have um, our negotiated salaries are higher than some neighboring communities uh, across all different all the different units. Uh, we also have more staff than uh, many other schools. We're very fortunate, and the community demands us to have, for instance, full-time librarians and library paraeducators in all three of pretty moderately sized elementary schools. All of our elementary schools have one school counselor, one school adjustment counselor, and one school psychologist, which is very atypical. Uh, but we believe in mental health, and we believe in supporting kids that way. So um, I do think you know, there's legitimacy to the concern about the per people cost piece. Um, but, you know, my experience is what, what the community demands is, is a little different in Amherst than what it is in some neighboring communities. Um, I think in terms of special ed versus regular ed, um, I think while the number of students is lower, for sure, in special education, the needs are such that um, often the funding that's required is significantly higher uh, when you're talking about students who have um, kind of adapted devices for communication, things like that. Uh, that can be quite costly, but they need them to access their curriculum. Um, in terms of central administration expense versus school administration expense, that's generally because, you know, Mr. Sheehan's lines and some other lines, you know, when it comes to curricular items are bought centrally across all the schools. So, you know, everyday math materials, things like that are bought centrally um, to be more organized uh, in that regard. Um, I think a number of the other ones I addressed earlier, um, I think, um, in terms of why we don't use um, contingency, uh, the contingency account, that's really our last resort, and we want to if we can't cover uh, our costs with appropriated funds, then we will go there, but we try not to go there unless we absolutely need to. Um, and in this year, because of some positive variances that we had that we discussed, uh, we feel like we don't need to go uh, down that road. In terms of the bus routes, Doug probably could talk a little more about it than me, but uh, we went out to bid and uh, the bids that we received the low bid is quite a bit higher than the bid uh, of the contract that expired. I don't know if you have more that you could share on that one, Doug. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll share a couple of things. So, so the increase from you know uh, last year to this year was <clears throat> uh, considerably uh, uh, higher than than not than we had projected. I, I think Mr. Mangano, before he left, had had a pretty decent estimate of what he thought the increase would be, which was on the order of about ten percent or so. Um, and of course, then that sets us on a trajectory to have higher costs over the ensuing couple of years. Um, 
our contract is, is such that once we set this base price in the first year, the subsequent years are based on a, a, a essentially a cost of living. It's not really cost of living. It's a CPI index, a computer consumer price index change, which typically is, over the last few years has been in the 2% range or less sometimes. Um, and so that, that moderates the cost. The, the estimates in the, uh, in the out years, as it were, in, in what you saw were, were uh, probably at about a 3% increase, which is decidedly a, a larger than what will likely happen with regard to, to the busing. But the, the big change was uh, from last year to this year's pretty significant increase in, in, in bus prices and, and busing costs for, for the district. And in terms of early childhood access, uh, Ms. Hayes is doing that follow-up work looking at facilities and other items. And um, until that work is complete, um, it's, um, you know, that budget line wasn't cut. So if there was additional work that we needed from her or from someone else, that we have that money in the budget for next year. And what she has expressed to us is there are grants um, that can support the expansion of early childhood access. And it may be the case that we use the money that is remaining in next year's budget around that to support uh, someone supporting us to write a grant uh, for that access next year. Um, but it's, it's not something that we're going to be ready for implementing um, in the next fiscal year. Um, I think I also want to clarify that there's no cuts to special education in this budget. In fact, there's um, addition of paraeducators um, as well as training for special education paraeducators um, <clears throat> in the budget. So uh, I just want to make sure that that is um, clear. I think that's probably all I have to say at this point. Okay. Or, Doug, or if the committee has other comments they'd like to make. I have a couple of things I'll add to that just a little bit, but partly to orient people to the sort of additions and reductions. So, so when we're putting the budget together, we're talking almost exclusively about the expenses. And since we're describing those expenses as increasing costs, so it costs $50,000 or $60,000 for a teacher, et cetera, et cetera. Anytime we reduce those costs, we represent those as negative numbers. And so what we're showing on this slide with the ads and, as additions and reductions is uh, things that are uh, reductions in the budget adjustment area are typically adjustments that are favorably impacting the, the expenses that we're incurring. And so, um, you know, in some cases, they're, they're cost avoidances. So like the prepay retirement incentives, for example, we budget a $50,000 uh, amount each year. Uh, this year, because we are able to, uh, to prepay those and knowing the some of that depends upon how many, what our staff are and how many are retiring and a whole host of other factors there. So for the coming year, we are not needing to budget that $50,000, so that reduces a burden in our, in our expense line. Uh, so several of those fall into that kind of category. Um, and so it, it, does, it is a little bit of an in, inverse logic when you see a negative number being a positive effect, but it's, it's what ha is happening there. Um, and so it, to, to one specific one, the stabilization fund contribution. So uh, the idea was is that we were going to try to build our stabilization, uh, our, our special education stabilization fund to a certain point. We don't want to build it too big because then we're not able to use it to provide service to kids. And so what we want to do is be able to build that up so that in the most extreme case when, when we are uh, in need during a con any given year uh, that might have that kind of an unexpected expense, we can tap into that. Um, we've built it to a place we think we're fairly comfortable with, and that's also part of uh, why when we're looking at our second quarter budget report, we're trying not to use that money so as to sustain that balance. So it's those two pieces go kind of hand in hand a little bit there. Um, but I do, uh, the, the one other thing I, I would say, uh, just in a general comment, you know, is, is that, um, you, you know, we are looking to, uh, you know, we're in a people business, and so uh, the services that we provide to the kids are done by people, and that's a fairly expensive thing. If you look at any government in enterprise, it's, it's a lot of individuals doing a lot of work for folks, and the uh, stuff they use is often not terribly expensive relative to the people, what they cost, what their benefits cost, uh, and, those, and those obligations to their future, like their retirement, et, et cetera. And so, you know, people are fairly expensive. Um, and I would, would also say that budgeting is, it is complex, it is difficult. We are trying and, and want to hear feedback about how to present it better. Um, I'm certainly relying on what my predecessors have done in regard to that. I think it is a very, very difficult and complex, uh, you know, area that we, we work in when we do the budget. There are lots of little pieces to this that we're trying to uh, identify the cost. There's a point where you, you get to so find a level of detail it becomes uninformative. But at the same time, there are some of the reasons things are where they are is because we're required to report on them in certain ways. Um, and so that's some of what 
what uh, goes into like per pupil expenditure accounts and, and reports to the state regarding that. So some of what's in our budget is driven by what the state expects us to report to them. Uh, some things are for our own education as far as how are we spending our money and what are we spending it on. Um, but certainly we're welcoming any comments people have about specifics on how, how we, we present that to the public at large. But it is, it is a complex uh, you know, entity. I mean, we're talking you know, $24 million worth of spending. There's a, there's a lot of, of uh, pieces to that. And I, for one, will just add a comment on that, that it is, it is complex, and I think um, we on the school committee benefited from that additional meeting that we had where we, we really dug into and asking all of these like, nitty-gritty questions about the definition and, and how um, definitions and, and categorizations, and um, that was earlier this year. Um, so they're definitely, um, I, I think we can definitely keep working on that to make it more accessible for in not just future committee members, but also for the for the community to be able to really understand what we're what we're spending our money on. Yeah. If, we, if I could add one other thing about that, There's, so so some of the titles that are on, like if you look at the line by line, some of the titles that are on those are driven by what's called our chart of accounts, which is basically the list of all the lines where we track money and uh, and try to account for things. And some of them are pretty straightforward, like office supplies. Well, that sounds like paper and pens and pencils, and it is, um, but I I do know that you know there are some that have a certain uh, legacy aspect to them and so the intention and purpose of them may have changed a little bit over time and we we are due for reviewing and and going through those and trying to refine those names a little bit that's a that's a pretty big project and so we've it's been discussed in sort of my office even before I got there about going through that process and trying to sort of bring some uh, consistency uh, and and normality to to all of that um, but it is an ongoing process and absolutely there there are some terms that are very much um, terms of art, so if you're in the business, you kind of know what they mean, but if you're not, they have no meaning whatsoever. It's, you know, um, so I, I do appreciate that and take that as a, as a valid criticism, and, and we'll, we'll work on trying to, to, to make that language a little more accessible to everybody. Thank you. So any closing comments? Ms. Spitzer? Um, I think Dr. Morris and Dr. Slaughter did a great job summarizing some of the responses, but there's one thing where if, um, I don't think we responded to, and I'd be happy to respond or maybe open it up for um, a response from Dr. Slaughter or Dr. Morris, but this question of the salary increases that our staff are getting and whether or not they're being evaluated, and my understanding is that the salary increases are largely negotiated, and I think that's worth highlighting for the public that we do have contracts that have annual cost of living increases that are negotiated on a regular basis. And so that, um, I, I don't know the evaluation piece, but I'd open it up to say that we probably are regularly evaluating the staff, but that the union negotiations that we engage in set into place um, salary increases that we must honor. And I think it's a good thing that we do. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. So the, the only thing I would say around the evaluation process is that, um, and Dr. Morris was, you know, instrumental in, in, in as assistant superintendent implementing it, the state came through and, and, and normalized that across all districts within the state of Massachusetts around certainly the, what's considered the professional staff, the teaching administrators um, and, and uh, professional staff. Um, we also, by virtue of contract, have you know, evaluations due for our, our paraprofessionals each year as well. And so everyone's getting evaluated every year in a various, and those, ver those evaluations differ depending on the type of work they do for us. Uh, but they are being evaluated, and, and, and for the purposes of primarily, it's, it's to enhance and, and grow the workers' ability and capability and, and understanding what they do and how to do it better. Mr. Denley? Yeah, I just, I just wouldn't want this to close without just making the, the very general point that, you know, staff do cost a lot, and we have a high budget, and we have a high uh, cost per pupil because our community makes the choice, is willing and is able to invest in our schools, and as a result, we have excellent public schools. Um, you know, I've had the unfortune of living in a city in the state that does not value public schools as well, where there were class sizes in the mid to upper 30s in the lower elementary grades, one teacher, no aides no extracurriculars, you had to pay for your buses, and it's a much different educational experience. And I, I'm, I, for one, am very 
uh, grateful to live in a community that gives us this much support. I think Dr. Slider and Dr. Morris do an excellent job of presenting uh, a transparent budget. Um, and uh, I am, I'm proud to be on a school committee that invests in our primary resource uh, of teachers in order to support our children um, as, as we go about this, this uh, exercise of public education. Yeah, um, there was just a detail of a question that I don't think I heard um, outlined. I, I was just wondering if, you, if there, we had a number about the uh, cost per pupil for spets, or special ed students. I was just waiting for Dr. Morris to maybe weigh in. But um, so, you know, the, um, you know, it depends upon the needs of the students to some extent. Um, you know, it, it, you look at any district within the state and their, their cost per special education student versus their cost per regular education student is going to be different and it's going to be much higher. Um, and so that's, that's not surprising. And, and one of the reasons is generally the, the kinds of supports that those kids need are more adults in their, in, in their educational program. And so when you have more adults involved, they all need to be paid and, and compensated. And so that really starts to hike uh, you know, the, the cost per pupil. That's a sort of short story on that. And that's part of why, you know, you have a very disparate number of students relative to a fairly equal amount of cost. That's a, that's the, I mean, it's not all of it, obviously, but that's the sort of quick answer that sort of fills in most of why those are so similar in, in the overall budget structure. Yeah, I think the only, the only thing I'll add to Dr. Slaughter's statement is that um, because we don't send a lot of students relative to other districts, um, out of district, uh, it, it, that's a different budget line in, in, our dis, in our budget as well as other districts' budgets. Um, so what you'll likely find is our special ed costs are higher because we maintain in-house services for a greater number of students, but our, how much we're spending for out-of-district students is lower than many other districts. So, you know, to a certain extent, it's how the state reports, how, how the state shapes what we report to it, which Dr. Slaughter knows better than me. Um, but it's... Um, you know, it's a little bit of a shell game as to where the costs are represented and uh, what that number actually means. Okay. okay. Um, with that, um, we are, unless there's more comments. Um, so we're uh, closing the, the FY21 budget hearing. Uh, so for those, those who were not here, we are, Rearran we've rearranged some of our agenda given um, that Dr. Morris is remote. So we're moving on to what's on your agen printed agenda is item J, dual language lottery. Could Dr. Slaughter, would you be able to pull up, go back to the agenda for yeah. this? I don't think that there's a handout in our packet for this, is there? Oh, there, there is. Um, let me see if I can. Probably near the end, I'm guessing, right? Why are you changing? Uh, it is page 50. Oh, sorry, I'm, it might be. I think it's yeah, that's the budget. Sorry, I'm looking at the old... It's page 140. Page 140, thank you. There we go. That's what I would have guessed. There we go. Woo. Okay. So uh, this is a revisit. Um, we talked about this, I believe, in January and um, at our January meeting, and we had we'd given some feedback to Dr. Morris and uh, Ms. Richardson on the lottery. Um, so this is sort of circling back um, and looking at that revision. Dr. Morris, did you want to introduce this? <coughs> Dr. Morris? Sorry about that. Um, I'm back on. So um, we talked about this in December and January, and at the January meeting we got some feedback um, that the school committee would like to see um, a higher threshold for students with Spanish language background lottery. And so um, 
we tried to come up with a proposal to implement that. And, and you know, on average, the last couple of years, the number of students who are Spanish speaking, you know, has been a little under 20. Um, but, you know, the future is uncertain, right? We don't know exactly what the demographics will look like. So we tried to... <laughs> Excuse me. We tried to take that into account and come up with a proposal that took the feedback from the from the school committee and had multiple tiers of notification to give families more time to enroll before seats were taken up, uh, particularly Spanish speaking or Spanish language background students. Um, so, of course, we're open to any feedback you'd have. We do have our enrollment event on March 18th, so we are hoping to tonight, even if there are edits, to have a final policy that we can share with the community at that enrollment event uh, again on March 18th. Okay. Looking around for comments or questions, Dr. Mr. Demling. Um, so there's, there's two changes to this that I'd like us to consider. Um, and if it's okay with the chair, I'll go through them one at a yes. time. So, um, Dr. Slaughter, if you could navigate just for the display at home to the next page, to the paragraph that starts, if, if fewer than 24 students enroll in the Spanish. Yeah, that one. And, it, and maybe just uh, pop up the, uh, the, hit the plus sign to make it, oh. to make it more visible. <laughs> um, so, so the part of the, the policy that, that I'd like to ask us to consider to adjust is, so basically we do the lottery on May 4th. Bilingual families, we have the um, the the number targets for a minimum of 20 and up to 24 students uh, on that date on May 4th, um, and then and then the second paragraph essentially holds off some of those slots for the Spanish-speaking potentially Spanish-speaking families um, until later dates, um, and 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 doesn't immediately fill up all available spots on May 4th with with um, with the non-Spanish-speaking. Um, students, uh, and so so what it what it does is it says if, if, unfulfilled, if unfilled by groups one and two, then two seats will be opened up t on July first, and two more on on August first. And what I'd like to see is change it to um, that the seats will be kept. Twenty four seats will be kept available uh, for late enrollment by students at one subsequent date. Uh, and that four seats would be open on August 1st. Um, and, and the reason is just that I just really come back to the point of school about why we're doing this program. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I really come back to the core principle about why we're doing this program is the main motivation for this, which is if, if we have 24 in-district Spanish-speaking students that want to participate in the program on May 6th, um, and, and we're allowing them in that program, we, 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 should, we should keep that open and as late as possible. So, and you know, the, the dis disadvantage of waiting until August 1st to open up those available seats is that you have up to two um, English-speaking, non-Spanish-speaking families uh, that would have to wait four more, four more weeks from July 1st to August 1st. Um, the, the big advantage, though, is that if, if we have Spanish-speaking students move into the district, uh, and depending on what year it is, this can be, it can be quite a number. Um, that affects their education for the rest of their rest of their uh, time here in the district. Um, and um, you know, with the primary motivator of uh, of addressing the, the achievement gap for Spanish speakers, um, I, th I think that that's in the cost benefit analysis. It's 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 a um, it's a fair trade off for me. So, um, want to get the thoughts on the from the other committee on committee members on that. Can you uh, state one more time specifically the edit that you would like to see in here? So, you know, I'll just, I'll just make the motion and then we can, we can do it. So um, I move to change the paragraph that begins if fewer than 24 students enroll. Now, uh, to the following, if fewer than 24 students enroll in the Spanish speaking bilingual group at this time, the remainder of 24 unfilled seats will be kept available for late enrollment of Spanish bilingual students at one subsequent date. If unfilled by groups one and two, four seats will be opened to groups three and four on August 1st. On August 1st, if there are still remaining seats, they, they will be filled by Spanish-speaking school choice students.
So we have a, a, a motion for an edit. Is there a second? Second. Are there discussion? Can we go back up and just so I can look at the three, four? I'm sorry, I, my computer it died on the way over and I don't have a copy um, in paper, so making this decision without the ability to look at it all at once is difficult for me. We need to go further up, oh, up to so there. I just want to remind, so group, just to I guess my opposition to this is just that I think it's a big burden to put on those families to wait until August 1st and at the, law, at the potential to lose kids to another program, specifically a charter program, would make me anxious about doing this given that I think last year, I mean, could you remind us what, what we're currently looking at in terms of the number of students in each program currently? Sure. Yeah, so, um, sorry, I was just making sure I wasn't muted. So, um, so out of the 39 students in Comandantes right now, we started the year with 37. So, um, 17 were Spanish speaking, 20 were, or had Spanish language background, I should say, and 20 did not. And we've had two students come mid-year um, who had Spanish language background or exclusively Spanish language um, skills. And I will say it's been a fantastic um, transition for those students to be part of a program where half their day uh, they're getting academic content in Spanish. Um, so we currently have uh, 39 students in Caminantes um, and it's a 2019 split. I have a, a follow-up question on that. Um, it's actually not that, um, but typically um, what is, so basically are typical enrollment patterns. Um, how is that, how are these two different dates impacted? So how typical is it for us to see additional uh, Spanish speaking students um, enter the district after, sort of between July 1 and August 1? Um, pretty typical, because um, families move to, especially before kindergarten, fam the families more generally move to the area, um, oftentimes in the summer months, so, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to say it's like a mad rush, but there's, you know, routinely because registration occurs not that far from my offices in the summer, there, there's people come in every day to register their kids. Um, so not all of them are kindergarten kids, not all of them are Spanish speaking or bilingual kids. Um, but, you know, uh, we do all our outreach in the, in the spring. But what we know is that um, families aren't all here um, in the spring to register their kids because some of them aren't living here yet. And, and, and just to follow up, in, historically speaking, um, how often do we have more than 20 or 24 Spanish-speaking students entering at kindergarten? Um, in terms of registered, it's not that typical. It has happened. Uh, we went back and pulled some data um, this afternoon. Um, I think part of it is that you look back and our class sizes, our, our grade level, our school sizes used to be a lot bigger. So, you know, you sort of have to scale down to the number of students who are in our district now in a kindergarten versus six or seven years ago when there were more students. Um, but I would say this past year where we had uh, 17 at the, f the beginning of the fall and then 19 uh, right now, that's a pretty typical year for us. Ms. Spitzer? Yeah. So I guess. I guess my concern is if, if, if you and, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name, but if, if you and the team feel like there's a need to do this, 
change that um, Mr. Dumling's suggesting. I'd support it, but I, I guess my concern is that holding these spots open for kids who are unlikely to attend would have no benefit, whereas it would have a negative consequence on the family that's waiting until August 1st. I'm just thinking, you know, I've got young kids, and, and that transition to kindergarten is a lot, and it would be nice to be able to tell your kid, you're going to be going to Fort River and not, you know, Crocker Farm or Wildwood, or, you know, starting to ha be able to have that knowledge of where your kid's going to land July 1st rather than August um, 1st. And so I guess my other question, the only other thing is if there is how hard and fast is it that if say two additional kids like this year ended up enrolling after this deadline and we had filled those seats with English speaking kids would we have any wiggle room or is it is it really hard and fast that we wouldn't be able to because I, I, I echo I really strongly feel like we shouldn't be saying no to anybody who is an English language learner of Spanish but could could you foresee a situation in which we'd have to do that if we had if we weren't to enact this change um, <laughs> yeah, let me think about that one for a second. It's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, I think last year we didn't fill beyond 20 English speakers, partially because we didn't want the balance to be off, right? So we didn't want it to go to 23 and 17, because that felt like that's further away from 50-50. And what we know is that uh, we typically get kids, you know, Amherst has a fair, fair bit of transiency in its school population and some of that transiency, although not exclusively or, or overwhelmingly, um, but does involve um, kids with Spanish language background. Um, so um, it's, a, it, it's a hard question to answer, right? I mean, because also 40 is not a magical number. We have other kindergartens that go over 40. We just try to keep this one as a new program. We wanted to keep the class size pretty reasonable. Um, um, yeah, uh, I don't know. I guess I'm not <laughs> giving you great uh, feedback or, or advice for how to manage this. I definitely see Mr. Demling's point uh, about waiting, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is uh, at what point do some families make different options? And uh, I think the flip side is would this policy make it next to impossible for non river families who aren't Spanish speaking to actually get into the program, right? Like if you look at your group for uh, students, um, you know, um, you know, I think once you get to that level, you know, it can get start getting a little tricky. Um, but I see both sides. I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, usually I come with a recommendation. I'll definitely do that with school choice like I did with budget on this one. I really understand where Mr. Dudley is coming from. I understand the concerns and um, we will certainly implement both the what's been proposed, which was based on feedback last time, as well as Mr. Dudley. Uh, both of these we can implement without an issue. It's really for the committee, you know, which way you want to go. We can we'll, we'll make either way work. Mr. Dudley. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say briefly, I think Ms. Spitzer's points are very valid uh, and, you know, they're they are real concerns and um, it, it is a cost to, to doing this change. Um, I, you know, like I, I, I mean, I think of it as a cost benefit analysis and you know, that there, there is a risk that someone, if they need to wait four more weeks to find out if they're in a program might make a different option, uh, that those one or two families might do that. Um, that is, that is a risk. That is a cost. Um, you know, I, I, I weigh that against the possibility of Spanish speaking students moving here in July and then not having that opportunity for the, the subsequent um, education. But, but I appreciate right. the discussion and I you know, respect the committee however we vote. Right, the only, I'm sorry, there's one other thing I should mention. Um, so with the grant, the second year of the bilingual grant, which we were fortunate to receive uh, partnering with Holyoke once again, we are trying to look about a summer program that would uh, happen likely in the month of July for students who are entering, it's optional program obviously, but who are entering the dual language program. Um, and so uh, under either of these scenarios, it, it, potentially kids, uh, if they wouldn't find out until August, they wouldn't be sort of, they wouldn't know enough whether, uh, they wouldn't have enough information to enroll in, you know, a summer program. It's still very much under work, so we don't have all the details worked out, but it's likely to occur in the month of July. Um, it's not a huge factor, but I, I you know, just in the, in the sake of uh, giving the committee all the information, 
that is a minor factor when we were thinking about things as well. Okay, any other comments? Questions? No? Uh, are we ready to vote or on the, on the motion on the table? Ms. Spitzer? So, I, I guess I just want to echo that I, I didn't hear a straight yes or no on whether or not we would have to say no to Spanish-speaking kids who were entering the district. So I would just like to say that I would, um, I would not be in favor of, um, <laughs> I want to make sure that I, in no situation would I ever want to deny a Spanish-speaking kid within our district the opportunity to enroll in this program. So if there were a way that we could make sure that that's the case, I, I don't want to be seen as advocating against making sure there's room for everybody who's Spanish speaking within this program. So is there any way we could accept this modification along with a stipulation that in the event that somebody enters, like the two kids who entered mid-year this year, that they would be accepted? Um, but maybe that would create a magnet. Of, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud through this, but because we didn't have this, I'm sorry, this, this proposal just came, so I'm thinking on, the, on my feet right now. But um, I guess the only downside of doing something like that would be if it creates a magnet for Amherst for Spanish-speaking kids, and then we don't have a program that's large enough to accommodate folks who move into the district. I think that could be a real risk, maybe not next year, but over time. Um, so I'm just putting it out there because I... I um, I, I think it's essential that we make this program open to folks who have a Spanish-speaking background. Could I make a process recommendation? Yes. Which is, I'm looking, and the registration event is the 18th. The next Amherst School Committee meeting is the 17th. Um, just from the tenor of the dialogue, and granted, I'm hearing it virtually, and my head's not totally working at all cylinders right now. Uh, I just wonder if people had two weeks to think about it and... Uh, we certainly can print in the morning on the 18th, and uh, and it's not going to affect anything we do on the 18th other than what we share. Um, so if the committee feels like it wants more time to consider it, uh, if you want to vote tonight, certainly the committee can vote tonight. But if it feels better to have more time to consider uh, all the variables and talk through and ask more questions, uh, that'd be fine with the administration if uh, we put this on for the 17th and then have a vote that evening. I, I, I do think, let's, if, if I see nodding heads, that that would be um, a good approach. Thank you for that suggestion. Um, and I do, just a, another question, since we are sort of tabling this right now, is I wonder if the, there's a way to phrase this particular section so that it's, it's also referencing the balance of English speakers versus Spanish speakers in there, because I do, that may help us get to the point that Ms. Spitzer was talking about, which is we don't want to be in the situation that we have that sort of 50-50 target so out of whack because we've enrolled more English speakers than, than not, and so, if we do have more students coming in after these, after this lottery that are Spanish speaking, that that might sort of, you know, like eyeing it not in terms of the number of seats, but in terms of the proportion that we will end up with as a result in the total. So I don't, I'll, I'll just put that out there. I don't know how to phrase that right now, but given this two weeks of time, maybe we can sort of ponder that. Mr. Demling? Uh, with the permission of the full committee, as Google is telling me I need, uh, in order to withdraw a motion, uh, may I may I withdraw my motion for the moment? Is that okay? Thank yes. you. I withdraw my motion. Thank you. Okay. So we'll we'll address this. We'll come back to this on the seventeenth. Okay. Great. So, thank you. Moving on to so the next item is item D on the printed agenda, which is our school choice hearing, um, and that would be. Would you like me to tell you the page, Dr. Slaughter? It is. All right, so it's uh, 55 minus 27, <laughs> or 140. I don't have the proper. What was the number again? I'm sorry. 
Um, it was on, in the old packet. It was page 27. So in the in the packet I have from online, it's 117. I'm not sure what you're, when you're working yeah, from, Yeah, 117. Doug. Thank you. <laughs> so just as a, a as entering the, the hearing, this is a hearing. Um, we're going to hear a presentation uh, from Dr. Morris on this, um, and then we'll open it up for public comment specific to school choice planning. And again, the process will be three minutes um, per, uh, per speaker, um, followed up with, um, if desired, uh, uh, follow-up comment or clarification from uh, either the committee or the or uh, Dr. Morris. All right, um, so as the, I'll just read through some of the slides um, that Doug put together that, you know, slots in the past have made available at each school based on class sizes um, and a lottery. The tuition that comes to the district is $5,000 plus if there's a student that has special needs, there's an increment um, specific to the student that comes with that. And they're tracked in a revolving fund and they cover costs um, normally paid by the general fund. On the next page, you see um, the balance. Um, so the blue bars are their expenditures. The, I guess, uh, I don't know what color that is, pink-ish? Um, peach. Bar, peach, thank you, are the revenues and the fund balance you can see. So the fund balance, I know for some might look high. You know, my experience in Pelham, which is about one-tenth the size of the Amherst Public Schools, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely healthy, but uh, as a relative scale, uh, especially when Pelham was high, they were routinely over half a million dollars uh, in terms of school choice funds. And the idea is that you want to try to balance, you know, how much you're uh, bringing in and then the revenue so you don't set up a structural deficit by uh, spending way more than you're bringing in. And so for next year, uh, in conversation with principals and others, uh, what we're proposing is only to accept a very limited number of choice students into kindergarten. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, we've sort of filled the quote-unquote empty seats at the other grade levels. We don't see them. There's a lot of space uh, for choice. And in terms of a limited number for kindergarten, uh, we want to think through uh, that we may have a consolidation plan for a building project. And we don't want to have to add an extra classroom because we took 20 choice kids. Um, and so we're, we're thinking in the, in the order of magnitude of 8 to 10, which, you know, if you distribute them across eight classrooms, um, that's one to two kids per classroom that doesn't require uh, building any extra spaces uh, for those students if they're still in the school when a consolidation uh, could potentially occur in the future. So uh, again, we're really just looking at kindergarten uh, and a pretty limited number for next year. We feel like our fund balance is, is healthy uh, and we feel like we want to you know, continue to not have that fund balance drop off, uh, but be cautious in our approach given the uncertainty of the building project and the implications that would come from it. Okay. Are there any clarifying questions from the committee? No? Ms. Spitzer? Um, could you just tell us how the 8 to 10 that you're proposing um, compares to so the last average of the last few years? It's a bit lower. Um, so, um, you know, we've been, you know, over 10, um, you know, this past year. I'm trying to think of if Doug could bring it up, but I'm not sure he can. It's hard not being there. I apologize. Um, but, you know, we've been more in the 12 to 15 zone. Um, Overall, um, it depends on the grade level. Some grade levels worked out where we didn't have spaces. Um, and by eight to 10, if we, we happen to have a high enrollment year, that's, it's not that we would definitely take eight to 10. It's that if there are slots uh, and empty seats, we would fill to that level, not that we would automatically take that number. But it is a bit of a reduction. No? Uh, so with that, we'll um, open up the uh, public hearing portion of this. Um, uh, please come forward. And a just a reminder, we'll have three minutes for comment. Hi, Tony Cunningham. Um, I'm really happy to hear what uh, Dr. Morris is recommending. I think that's really smart um, 
to only take kindergarten and reduce the number so that in a consolidation scenario, it will not require extra classrooms or extra teachers. Um, when those, if, if we go to two schools and one school has 600 kids, if more than 10 school choice kids were there, you would be, or one to two per classroom, you would be triggering another class. Um, I still have the question about uh, what's the net school choice balance. So what's the difference between what we take in on school choice children and what we pay for those that go out? I don't think that was answered in the previous um, phase, the previous hearing, excluding the special ed increment. Um, and then I just had a question about the deficit. When you talk about a structural deficit, I thought the idea was that school choice children did not add cost, that they were added just in, um, to top off classrooms. So when you say you're, you're spending money, that money is going on the whole pool of children, I understand. It's not going on um, just the school, it's not going on the school choice children. It's going on regular education. So just a clarification of that, because creating a structural deficit seems to indicate that you're spending money on those children um, which I thought was not the case, if you understand what I mean. Um, I do, yeah, so I, I could answer that. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I can answer the last one, um, Mr. Slaughter, Dr. Slaughter may be able to answer the other one. So what I meant by structural deficit, for instance, what's happened in Pelham is that um, they were spending so much, uh, they were spending significantly more of school choice revenue than they were bringing in. And so um, it wasn't that they were spending it on specific kids. Uh, and I appreciate that that's, you know, I, I need to be more clear about that. It's that, um, so every year, uh, if you are bringing in, I'm gonna use kind of uh, round numbers. If you're bringing in 300,000, but you're spending 350,000, you've got a $50,000 gap in your budget and your total fund balance is going down $50,000 a year. And if you don't address that structural deficit, eventually that fund balance is going to be zero. And so that's the thing to, that we've learned Pelham to be cautious about is if that fund balance starts going down, you're relying on that to fund your operating budget. Um, so making sure that it doesn't go down too, too sharply is just something to be cautious about. But I apologize about the confusion. And do you know what the net school choice balance is? Do you know how much we're paying out? I don't. I know it's significantly less than what we're bringing in, but I don't have that off the top of my head. I don't know if Dr. Slaughter has that, um, but I know he could get it, that data. Unfortunately, it's not off the top of my head, but it's, you know, it's like eight to one or something like that, roughly. Just so it gets recorded properly. I don't know that number off the top of my head either, but we do have a. Uh, significantly smaller school choice out versus school choice in. Um, but I'm happy to report that to the committee. It's a similar question that Mr. Dimling asked earlier relative to, to uh, charter tr costs. So I can, I can put those numbers together for you and, and for the public at large as well. Okay. Any additional, any further comment? So uh, it's Caridad Martinez, member of the School Equity Task Force. So um, Mike, did I hear you say that you are okay with allowing, was it 10 kindergarten spaces? Is that what was said for school choice? Eight to 10. 10, eight to 10. So um, does that include the school choice for Spanish speakers for the dual language program? Is that number being, are those children being considered in that number? That's total school choice is my, Dr. Morris? Sure, yeah, I didn't know whether to wait for the end to get all the oh, okay. questions yeah. or. Yeah let's, yeah, let's just continue with your. Well, no, I wanted to ask that question. The, the other person asked that question, is, asked the question and then got the answer because I, I wanna know that before I go forward. Is that something? Sure, so the, the state law around school choice is that um, sibling, uh, having a sibling in the district is the only preference that one can have. Yeah, but my question is, in, in when we were talking recently about the dual language program, there was a group. So that, that uh, I think I can clarify, that, that is, there's a school choice in, 
So that's in the inside school it's choice. Total, it's not being it's, once they're yep, yeah, right. So the okay. two don't have anything to do with each other. It's okay. just if there happens to be school choice students, kindergartners that are Spanish speaking, that's that t group two A. Right. So I am definitely not in favor of not bringing in school choice. I think that the school should bring should keep school choice an option. Um, I don't think that you should eliminate it this year for various reasons. One is because you, um, it could actually be the potential for bringing in Spanish speakers from other districts. There are many of them. So there can actually be some kind of um, uh, outreach about that and to let that know that this program is actually exists and you just might get other people. I'm not, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with that there are less Spanish speaking children and more non-speaking, non-Spanish speaking children in that program already. So this might be a good way, you know, uh, so I, I would not eliminate it. I would, I would suggest to this committee not to eliminate that and, and there's other reasons. So I, I started off earlier saying that public education is funded mostly, not completely, but mostly through property taxation, and which we already know causes inequality. I think the Amherst School District has um, privilege Right, you have more resources because your property taxation is higher. This, you know, it's a wealthier community than many of the communities around, and so you just have that. That's a privilege that you have, which to most people in this country is unfair. Children should, all children should receive the same kind of funding for schools. All schools should be just as well funded. It should not be because there are wealthy people in a neighborhood, and because of that, some children get better. So. The Amherst School District has a social justice mission. It has a mission for multiculturalism. And so I feel that it has a moral respons responsibility to share its resources. Uh, a lot of families who want to access Amherst School resources um, probably don't live here because they can't afford it. If they could, they would live here so their children can go to these schools. They can't afford to live here. We all know there's a crisis in housing here for low income people, and that is a fact. So they live in in other areas and hope for the best that their child might get into this school because they feel like this is a better school district with more resources for their children. So um, that's why I think you should not, uh, um, that you should accept children in school choice and, um, and, you know, and particularly think about how that can also become you know, attractive to Spanish speakers for the dual language program. Thank you. Mr. Demling? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, our f former chair, uh, Anastasia Ordonez, uh, had some input uh, tonight for the school choice hearing. Uh, she was unable to make it uh, due to a scheduling conflict, um, but I have her but one minute comments, if that's okay to read into the public comment for uh, school choice hearing. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, doc dear school committee and Superintendent Morris, I'd like to comment on school choice. School choice increases diversity of students and families in the district. High income families already have school choice because they can afford to move to and live in areas with high quality public schools or they enroll their children in private schools. By keeping modest school choice options available in our Amherst schools, we ensure that our students and those of neighboring towns get to benefit from our educational offerings. By keeping a reasonable limit on school choice, we also keep class sizes small since we hire the teachers we need and we're able to maintain a low student to teacher ratio. Having served on school committee, I know that school choice seats are open to only when enrollment of resident students is low enough that choice students can be accepted without exceeding class size limits set by you and the superintendent. Keeping school choice also amplifies our reputation as a desirable public school district. Families who choose to attend Amherst schools want to be here and school choice students bring different perspectives and experiences to benefit our schools in many ways. I encourage the school committee and superintendent to continue our school choice options. School choice students do not excessively contribute to cohort size, number of classrooms, or school populations. Thank you for all you do, Anastasia Ordonez. Thank you. Seeing no other comment or questions, um, we will move on and close the public hearing. And now we, were, we are back to our um, agenda um, order. So we're moving to uh, what is item B on the printed agenda, second quarter budget update. At this point, I think I will um, depart. Um, thank you for uh, accepting my uh, virtual participation tonight. 
Uh, I would have rather been there. Um, just health wasn't contributing to that, but I really appreciate uh, your flexibility tonight. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you soon. Feel better. Thank you. We, we are at the second quarter update, right? Yes. Okay, good. And I don't have to tell you the page number, so. <laughs> Sorry. So. I, well, I brought this as a separate file. That's why okay. it's like that. So it's a little, um, and I'm going to shrink it just a little bit. I don't know if that makes it too hard for people to read. Let me know if that is the case, but I kind of want to put all the numbers on, on one page, if at all possible. Oop. Yep, it's going to have to be a little bit tiny there. Um, hopefully that's, you know, as projected as, is available for folks to read. Um, you know, the long story short, through the first uh, six months of the year, the first half of the fiscal year, uh, the budget's doing okay. There are a couple of problem areas, or I shouldn't say problem areas. I should say areas of concern by virtue of the fact that we had some une unexpected expense. This was noted by Mr. Mangano earlier in the year. Those, those expenses were um, anticipated, uh, the full extent of which were not as well known at that time. They're more well known now. Um, and then, so that's what you see in the district-wide SPED and the, and the district-wide support. Both of those are considerably over budget at this point in time. Um, the other areas under contracted, under payroll accounts under contracted uh, payroll, uh, largely we've accounted for and, and encumbered or, in, in, and by encumbering I mean, you know, we're sort of reserving the money in anticipation of expense that we're gonna need for, for, for certain kids over the course of the remainder of the year. Um, but that's a fairly, you know, we've, we've expended a, a fair amount. There's not a lot left relative to where we are in the year, and so there's not a lot of wiggle room if something else comes up that needs contracted services that weren't anticipated. So um, so that's an area to keep a close eye on, which is why we've, we've highlighted it in, in yellow. Um, and so the rest of the, the second quarter budget is, is, is in pretty good shape. In other words, that the, you know, payrolls where we think it should be for this time of year and our, you know, our expected expenditure plus what we anticipate for the rest of the year works out to be about what we think it's going to be. Um, our specific expenses at, at the schools or in, in uh, you know, other programs, administration, information systems, et cetera, are, are in pretty good order. Um, you know, a couple are a little over where you would expect them to be. So it looks as though that, you know, like utilities or, or uh, facilities, excuse me, is a little over budget. Again, that's about, you know, our projection and whether our projections accurate, accurate or not. But that's a fairly small uh, overage in those couple of areas. You'll see at the bottom is control accounts. In a sense, you know, this is a variety of pieces that go into that control accounts. But that sort of holds some of those various resources, uh, contingency funds and the like that we use to help support um, those unanticipated costs and that sort of thing. Um, what's not in here is the, the UMass funds, so they're not shown at present in here, and so that's, that's part of why I say that what we'll do during this next quarter, basically, which will end at the end of the month, um, but what we'll do at the end of this month is we'll, we'll weigh those different uh, 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 resources, whether it be UMass uh, support of our, our district this year, um, and and uh, contingency funds that we plan for, and then the third one, which is eluding me at this moment because it's getting late in the day. Um, uh, and, you know, potentially some of that money that we budgeted to, to go into contingency, you know, we use it before it actually gets into contingency for contingency. So we'll, we'll weigh those different options as to what's the best approach. Um, the idea being that we'd like to get our state special ed stabilization to that to that balance we were anticipating this year without these uh, these unanticipated needs. Um, so we'll weigh those different options and we'll come to you with those if, as, as necessary to, to, to sort of balance out the budget and finish out the year. Um, and so, you know, we're in the very, very fortunate circumstance of having that support from UMass this year. I think that really gives us some options available to us. I think we would have been able to cover those, those overages there are. Um, I will also note that, uh, you know, there are things like circuit breaker and there are things um, like, what, what do they call it? I believe extraordinary aid, I think is what they call it. So if you have an extraordinarily large expense in a year, the state does have some funding available to help uh, districts that have an, a really extraordinarily large unanticipated, uh, particularly special education cost. 
Um, so you can get some support from the state to help that. Uh, we will apply for those funds as well, and that'll help uh, you know, mitigate this as well. So, so there were a, um, you know, when we're when we're building contingencies into our budgets, um, sometimes we're we're doing it because we don't know the answer to the question yet, which is what Mr. and Dr. Morris was talking about earlier with the you know kids that are being evaluated and and they're trying to assess what's the right uh, program choices for those kids. But sometimes it's uh, you also plan in some some uh, some circumstances that you just you don't know that they're coming. Um, they've just moved to town and and they have needs. Sometimes people, sometimes that doesn't happen. So uh, the reverse happened in the regional school district this year. Uh, so in, on their end of things, a couple of kids uh, moved on or moved out of the district, and so there were anticipated high costs in, in special education that weren't realized in this circumstance in Amherst. This year we had the reverse of that. We had some kids move to town who had and need some support <clears throat> in ways that, that uh, put a rather significant uh, crimp on our budget. And so, you know, that's why we have some of those contingency funds. We, we plan those in in a few different places. We, we plan those in uh, in, in uh, our anticipation of what our health insurance costs are going to be because we don't know all the people that we're going to hire for next year and which ones will or won't elect uh, health plans and what kinds of health plans. So we build some of that into our budgeting as well. And we try to, you know, we try to use the experience we have over several years to, to uh, identify those, those types of contingencies, what are reasonable size numbers, um, and try to, you know, not overcommit funds to things that aren't directly uh, available and useful. And, and so we're, we're trying to strike those balances all the time. Um, but just to, just to recap, the sh long story short is the budget's okay. There are a couple of areas that, that are of concern we'll keep an eye on. We, we will have to divine what we want to do relative to how we fund those overages uh, and what best suits our overall trajectory of, of, of uh, how we want to structure some of our uh, contingency funds for the next year. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think with that, I'll leave the questions to you guys. Ms. Spitzer. So just um, going right off of what you ended with, it sounds to me like these um, increases in the district-wide, that accounts in the district-wide support, are those then going to be it sounds like they're already reflected in the, fisc the next fiscal year's budget. In, they are. And that's tied to that special contingency line item that we were seeing in the adjustments? or No, I think in, in, back into in, in regard to the, I would say that the, the lion's share of the kids that are here now are budgeted in the regular sort of normal places. Um, there are other kids who have, um, so, I'm trying to say this in a way that makes makes some sense. <clears throat> so the unanticipated kids that we had come this year may have come with an IEP, for example, or a particular set of needs. Um, the contingency that was, so those kids have been budgeted for that expense in the coming year. Um, I think the contingency that, that was in the uh, additions and reductions was in particular a kid that has presented in this year and is, in, is currently being uh, identified and what is the right programming for that kid. And so that's in the contingency because we're not sure exactly where we would place that in the budget at this point. We're, we're likely to anticipate a need. It may not realize, it may be once they finish uh, the work that they do uh, in, in evaluating and determining what this kid's best programming needs are that it, it's not nearly that big or it's not in, you know, or it's exactly that big and it goes in this part of the budget. So, but until we fully have that realized and, and figured out, it sort of sits into that, that contingency category for now. Mr. Demley? So with some of these expenses potentially being eligible for circuit breaker, you know, the change with the, the phase in of the transportation being eligible, is, is that something that tracks back a year? Like we, we incur the expense one fiscal year and then we apply for reimbursement and then it shows up in the next fiscal year? I'm just, you know, given, given that the transportation is slowly phasing in over the next five, seven years in terms of eligibility for circuit breaker, I didn't know how that so, planning works. So fortunately, I went to a, uh, a presentation by the, uh, the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed today on that very subject, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Brady was also there. And so, um, so the interesting thing is, is circuit breaker is, is a particular sort of flavor of support, um, and it relates to sort of... Uh, it's funding that the state will grant you in a, in above a certain funding that you cover. So there's a foundational amount of money that's uh, expected of every district to, to fund their, their program at. 
Four times that is the multiplier. Once you get above four times that foundation cost, then you're eligible for circuit breaker. So the money's above four times. And fortunately, with this new change to, to allow transportation uh, costs to be considered in that, um, they set the, the four times number based on fiscal 19, which is actually better because the, it would have, it makes the threshold a little lower, to be perfectly honest. So once our costs for a given kid get above four times that foundation funding, uh, which for this year is, I want to say, in the $45,000 range, so once those costs for that kid get above $45,000, then it's eligible for, for that circuit breaker support. And so those dollars that are above that, that threshold um, are eligible, um, and then they try to fund for the services that are provided, they're trying to fund it at 75% of that. So you figure out the number above the sort of threshold, then you take that number and multiply it by 0.75, and that's the support they give you. So you're still, it's not, they don't make you whole once you get above four times, they're, they're doing the best they can. And sometimes it's less than that depending on the overall amount of money available, you know, uh, based on what was appropriated. So if the needs are extraordinarily high, that 75% doesn't always get met. Um, the addition of, of transportation allows for us to add transportation costs uh, to, uh, to that, and so getting to that, uh, that threshold for a circuit breaker, it, those transportation costs now help get us to that threshold, um, which would potentially qualify a few more students. Um, but it's fairly nuanced. They're still, you know, they're, they're phasing it in as far as the support for the transportation costs that fall above the, the circuit breaker threshold. Uh, they're phasing in at 25%, and then they'll go to, I think it's 25, 50, 75 as they go through the next few years. Um, so they will pay those monies next fiscal year for expenses incurred this fiscal year. That was a really long way to get to the answer that you wanted, right? I'm sorry about that. I was just trying to paint the picture a little bit. But yes, you're typically capturing the money the next year, um, and then you have, you can use it in the year in which you're paid, or you can carry it another year. Circuit Breaker allows you to carry one extra year. So it's actually, you can use it two years after you incurred the cost. So again, this is one of those where sort of revolving funds can be helpful to sort of mitigate spikes and valleys in, in funding sources and, and, and expenses. Um, but you do have, with those Circuit Breaker, you do have the year that you receive the money and one more, and, you, and, it, and then if you don't spend it, you have to give it back, which we don't do. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. Thank you. So moving right along, we are uh, looking at fee vote. And we have seen this fee schedule before, so what we're looking to do tonight is to vote on, um, on this proposed fee schedule. Correct. It hasn't changed since Mr. Mangano actually presented it to you, I think, originally in October, perhaps, yep. early November. Do you need any explanation or? Maybe a brief explanation because sure. um, at least one of us was not on the committee in October. All right. So long story short on, on the fees is that we're, we generally are looking to increment them a little bit each year instead of having big, you know, big changes in them. And so what you'll see is percentage changes are fairly small by and large. There are times, however, when, when we'll want to do, for example, if you look at the preschool, uh, we went up 25 cents because it's a nice round number. It works out a little bit easier. Some of the other ones, when you start getting in the before school programs uh, and the, the full fee, you know, they're pennies because on the overall cost, it doesn't, it doesn't end up mattering that much. On the school lunch, uh, we, we jumped a full quarter. Again, that's partly about making change at the, at the register. It's a lot easier when you deal with quarters instead of pennies um, and kids that are in third grade, right? So, you know, um, that's part and parcel of that. The other thing with the, with the school meal prices in particular is there is, uh, by virtue of participating in the National School Lunch Program, we are compelled to have our price set uh, to keep us eligible to, to remain in the program, and so we can't have our costs too low. Um, and so we, we're trying to move those along just enough to stay eligible in the program. And if you'll look at the history there, you'll see that we went to $3 and we stayed there for four years, and now we're gonna go to three and a quarter. We'll probably stay there three or four years as well before we're compelled to change it again. Uh, but it is a, a, a bit more sizable jump 
uh, than the other changes that are in the one, two, three percent kind of range. Um, so the idea again is to kind of keep pace with inflation a little bit and not have huge shocks to people's system as they as fees change or need to change. Thank you. Any questions? No. Any motions? Move to accept the fiscal year 2021 fee schedule as presented. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify yes by raising your hand. It's approved four to zero. Thank you. So uh, our next item is item E. So we're back on track now on, the, on our uh, agenda flow. Um, and this is uh, looking at our warrant approval process again. Um, so I can give a brief introduction, but I, I, I don't know if Dr. Slaughter, if you have anything you want to add, but I know that um, we had, just as background, we had discussed that we were going to sign warrants and approve warrants as a committee rather versus an alternative approach, acceptable approach would be to assign um, or appoint one member um, of the committee to sign all warrants and present the warrants um, at the, at, at each of our committee meetings. What um, I think Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris have experienced is that that becomes problematic given that we meet just monthly um, and um, and we've discussed at our recent meetings because of the massive quantities of paper that, um, that get produced in, in that process that it, it feels a little inefficient um, uh, in, that, in that process and potentially cumbersome for, for the district in terms of meeting needs. Do you want, is there anything? The only, th the only other thing I would, would add to that is just, you know, one concern that we run into as far as, you know, it's, it, by virtue of the nature of purchasing in, in and, and expenditure generally is fairly, um, well, Byzantine, I'll use the word Byzantine. Um, you know, there's a lot of steps that are involved and required uh, for audit purposes, for, you know, compliance purposes, for regulation purposes, et cetera. And so it's a fairly complex process, which makes it a little bit slow to begin with. And so um, anything we can do to help move things along, because we can't release checks to people to pay them until you guys sign. And so I think about not so much this time of year where we meet a little more regularly, sometimes more than once a month, uh, but when we get to summertime and we might go a long span, um, you know, the, the Municipal Modernization Act helped by creating this new mechanism by which you can designate someone who then just reports next time, but by virtue of that, then when you don't do it that way, then you've got a much more cumbersome process than what you had before. So, um, you know, I'd love for you to change it, but again, it's you, your call is reg with regard to that, and, and uh, so I want to support you guys as far as what you need informationally. Um, you know, we've, we've used some reports that sort of categorize it by sort of broad areas of spending. Um, if that'll work for you as, as it seems to have been working for the region, that's perfectly fine by me, but if you want something a little different. Um, you know, one of the concerns with putting sort of the full warrants into like a packet electronically is it often contains some sensitive information. We want to be very conscientious and careful of that. Um, so that's the other thing. Mr. Demling? I mean, personally, the, the driving principles for me on this process are as long as we're legal, that school committee members have access to view the detail warrants should we want to, so should we show up to the district office and request them, um, and that we're efficient with the uh, limited resource of the committee's time. Um, to, to that end, I feel like the regional process has worked fairly well for appointing a member. Um, I'm getting some different shakes of heads, um, <laughs> so perhaps that's a bit of a discussion. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, and, and if, if we're going to vote, um, be just having the confidence that it's, it, that it's been reviewed, you know, not having a, a stack of papers that we're hurriedly going through uh, at the time seemed, seemed suboptimal. But uh, anxious to hear any additional points of view. <laughs> I think I'll... I'll I, I, I was nodding when you said it's working well, but I, I do, it, it, had a, it had a, rocky is probably too negative a word, but it had a cumbersome, challenging start. Um, that said, um, I, I, I do agree that appointing one person um, to sign warrants may help this process along and um, can be efficient just modeling after that. Um, and 
in, unless somebody else w wants to volunteer to do that, I will volunteer myself to be that person. Um, but unless somebody wants to violently over take my volunteer. <laughs> it, it might be wise to designate a backup in case you're not available. That would be wise, Cause, yes. Because we've had to leverage that for the region yeah. recently. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess we're looking for a, um, unless others object, um, looking for a backup to me as a I believe I might be the only one able to actually serve as the backup. Um, so I am. Probably. I, yeah, so um, <laughs> I, I mean, I guess, so just to put in my two cents on this process and not, I, thank you for volunteering and I will support you being the person to, to do so, but I, I just want to put out there that it it is quite um, time consuming and as the person who's been the backup for the region, can I discuss that experience here? Yeah, I think so. I think it's informative to what's going on. It's informative on. to what's going on. I'm not going to mm -hmm. debate it, but it's just that um, it it's time consuming, and, and it's it's um, in that you go to the office, you need to review all of the warrants, and then you sign them, and then you need to report. So I think it would be useful, um, and maybe we could work together because currently I am the person doing it for the region to come up with a way to um, report it efficiently, like creating a spreadsheet or a Google Doc or some some way that we can standardize how it's reporting. So when that person, if you're away on a work trip, it's easy to step in and and um, take over that duty because I think because we're new to it, it the pro the process is is not um, solidified yet. So we need to figure out, uh, I think, a good way to sh automate it, for lack of a better term. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I will volunteer to be the backup. I'm currently going in now to do the region, so it, it shouldn't be too much of a burden. But it does require also good, con I would say, make sure strong communication with the staff in the business mm -hmm. office to coordinate the timing. And I, to that point, if I may, um, I think for us, as far as operationally, is if, if you have a regular time that you can come, then we'll plan accordingly. I mean, that always works best, mm -hmm. you know, and so, um, and not, not, it's not to say you both have to have the same time so that if you're not available, she's available vice versa, but, but I do think that that helps us get into a rhythm as far as our workflow and, and planning our work and that sort of thing. If that's not possible, then that's not possible, and we'll sort of, con you know, then there's a lot more emails that have to go back and forth to coordinate. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if you can pick a regular time, then that makes it a lot easier for my staff to go, okay, I've got this, this deadline to try to meet and try to have as much sort of put together in, in a timely way. Um, so that would be the one, one thing I would ask. Mm -hmm. And I think that works easier for, I think, our representative as well. So, so you'll probably need to take them vote, which probably can include who's going to be the signer. But the other thing is you actually do have several warrants that I passed in front yeah. of you earlier, which you will need to actually make motions on and vote. And I think there are maybe five of them there. One is a transfer of funds for a student activities account, but the others are all just sort of expending X dollars for accounts payable. They, so let's tackle the... That's the, the second piece, but I don't the, want us to forget that and then not actually be yeah. able to do anything yeah. with them. I realize that if we did it in the reverse order than the way it's listed under this agenda item, so I apologize. Um, so do we have a motion on the warrant approval process? Um, I move to have Allison McDonald serve as our appointed person to sign Amherst School Committee, Amherst... Warrants. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. F approved 4 0. Um, and I move to appoint Carrie Spitzer as the backup um, warrant approver and signer for Amherst School Committee. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. 4 0. Now, moving on, and um, Dr. Slaughter, I'm going to ask for your help in how we should read, read these into. So what I would do, with the exception of these, the rest of them, what I would do is the following. Um, uh, move to approve the warrant dated this for this amount. Okay. And that's pretty much all you need to do. And you can do, you 
can probably read all of them in one motion. Okay. Of those kinds, and these are just um, transfers. So I move to tr you know appropriate the transfer of. Got it. You know, three, 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 okay. To do it. Thank you. Um, uh, okay. Chair, uh, could, could I ask for? Um, so I was about to suggest a five-minute recess anyway, um, and. It, I would be more comfortable having a little bit of time to review the warrants that we're about to vote on. Um, so that would kill two birds with one stone. So, mm -hmm. no. A second. All those in favor for five minute recess? <laughs> Four zero. We're recessed. Okay. So I have no gavel, but. <laughs> um, calling the meeting back to order at 825. Ow. <laughs> They didn't, they didn't leave the gavel for you? Yes, that's my, my hand, my handmade, uh, yes, I should, but, um, okay, so I will read these. Um, we are approving a series of warrants, and I'll read them off now that we've all had a chance to review them during our recess. Um, to approve, I move to approve the warrant dated March 2nd, 2020, number S030220 in the amount of $36,613.27. And the warrant dated January 31st, 2020, number S013120 in the amount of $4,302.73. The warrant dated February 7th, 2020, number S020720 in the amount of $235,902.35. And the warrant dated February 21st, 2020, number S022120, in the amount of $53,091.49. Second. So moved, seconded. Um, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Passes 4 0. And now I move to approve the following funds transfer requests from the uh, Fort River principal requests a transfer of $1,781.88 from the town control account for subsequent deposit to the school student activity account dated February 19th, 2020. And the transfer request from the Crocker Farm Principal requests a transfer of $2,100 from the Town Control Account for subsequent deposit to the school's student activity account dated February 20th, 2020. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by raising your hand. Four zero. So. Moving on, we are at item F, Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, so this one, um, uh, at the first meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, not quite a month ago, um, or just about a month ago, um, we discussed the agenda and schedule and um, were able to have that schedule adjusted to um, meet outside of standard business hours so that the meetings will now be on Wednesdays um, at 5.30, thank you, <laughs> in, um, in the Bang Center. Um, so seeing that, um, A, we've um, lost one of our, our JCPC members um, with Eric Nakajima leaving um, and resigning from the committee, um, and also um, I am not able to uh, continue my uh, service on that um, committee as well. We need to appoint two representatives for, uh, from this group um, to serve on the JCPC. Do we have any volunteers? Two volunteers. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Mr. Demling. Yeah, um, so I appreciate the, so you've been doing a lot of work recently as uh, vice chair of the region and chair of this committee as well as the other subcommittees. So um, yeah, we, we do have to share the load. We have some other big ticket time consuming committees coming up, um, like the school building committee. And, and I'm not sure I'm going to be available uh, to do that as an option. So um, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to do this. Um, the one time conflict I have is 
I'm going to be out of state on Wednesday, April 1st, which is um, according to the schedule that you sent out, the day for uh, doing the final vote from the JCPC vote. I, I may be able to uh, participate remotely in that meeting. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but, you know, if the committee is fine with, um, with that, you know, somewhat of a schedule risk, I mean, I would certainly be able to uh, communicate with Ms. Spitzer any concerns I had at the meeting. Uh, and it sounds like things are going to get mostly drafted and finalized in the meeting before that anyway. So, But with that, I'm, 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 I'm happy to serve. Thank you, Mr. Demley. Ms. Spitzer? And I would just also really appreciate, wanted to state my appreciation of... Um, your service on it, but also for advocating for moving the time because um, I would not be able to serve or to stay at the original time. So thank you. And thank you to everybody else on the JCPC who um, accommodated our schedules. I feel like I'm the uh, vice chair of scheduling lately. So, um, <laughs> um, so um, unless there's objection or comment from anybody else, then we will... Um, officially appoint um, Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Demling as our representatives for JCPC. Thank you. And I will let the, the rest of that committee know that, um, who, we, who will be representing us. Thank you. Um, moving on now to item G, MSBA update. Um, so at our last meeting, we had a conversation about, uh, what we had a presentation from Dr. Morris on the MSBA um, process and the formation of the school building committee and we had some discussion at that point about um, our input to the town manager um, on that composition of the building committee um, and we tabled that and Mr. Harrington and I met briefly to talk about that and sort of come back to this committee um, with some thoughts on that so Mr. I'll turn it over to Mr. Harrington to share what we talked about. All right, so like the, the key points that we had were that we would, uh, we would need a group that's committed to an, an outcome as outlined in the SOI, statement of interest. Um, we'd also need at least an individual with experience in community outreach and communications, like that would be very important to open up the conversation. Um, we'd need a parent from each elementary school and possibly a PGL representative. I missed that. And then, um, so overall, kind of like the idea was to have like a larger group with uh, subgroups and potentially a, a dedicated outreach subgroup. That being the, the key element is the outreach and broadening the conversation, kind of. It's about what we came up with. We were um, in the, the building on the comment about the the size of the committee. I know that in past, um, when we've talked about feasibility committees or building committees, um, there's always, and I, I wasn't on school committee at that time, but I remember and recall conversations about the size and um, the effectiveness of very large groups. And I think sort of looking at sort of some of the recent working group models where there are very large groups of and constituencies, it works well when that is able to be able to broken up into smaller groups. So I think what we were, what Mr. Harrington and I were talking about was that we wouldn't be averse to having a large group if that sort of same approach and model or similar approach and model was taken that there could be sort of subgroups that could be tackling different pieces of it. For example, the community outreach and, and engagement process. Mr. Demling? Yeah, it's, it's interesting on the size of the committee. Um, so o over the years, you know, I've, I've heard from people who have observed the committee, who participated on the committee, uh, and, and mo more recently, I, I tried to reach out with, to people who served on, and, and uh, a pretty common theme was that the uh, thought that the committee was too large, um, and that um, attrition was a real issue. Um, this is a pretty massive time commitment, right? And not all the meetings are exciting. You know, there's a lot of boring sort of procedural procurement kind of stuff you have to get through. Um, and so to have someone there, you know, who's there at the beginning and through the educational vision and then the proposals and communication is important. So it's, it's I, I don't know, I, I guess I can see it both ways, you know, the, sort of the pro-con. Um, the larger a committee you have, the less likely you are to have everybody be showing up consistently and to, um, to be there throughout the whole process. Um, Yes, I, 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 personally, I don't feel too strongly one way or the other, so long as 
um, as the work gets done efficiently. But um, yeah, but that that is a consideration. I, th I think one um, th we we did sort of encounter this theme back in the day when we were forming up the um, uh, the Fort River Feasibility Committee, and we sort of came to the conclusion that you know if you if you really wanted representation from every person. Uh, and every and every group um, that you were interested in, you would you'd end up with a 60, 70 person <laughs> committee at, at the minimum. And so, um, so I think I think it, on that front, if if you went with a smaller committee, I, th I think it's important to emphasize that that this is you know the, the the purpose of the building committee is to facilitate a solution that the community is going to support. It's it's not where the uh, the preferences the battles over personal preference should be fought. Right, it's it's uh, like I'm sure people will have very strong views, and, and it's it's good and healthy about you know where sh where the building should be. How how should we get to 600 students? What's the um, uh, what's the implementation of net zero going to be? All, all all those all those things. But in 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 my sort of understanding of, of what the focus of this committee should be, it, it, the, there should be no bullets or flags flying at these at these meetings. You know, and I, th I think that's something that. Um, as the interviews are being conducted by the town manager um, should be emphasized is that um, if you want to advocate strongly and make your personal views known, great, but this isn't the venue to do that. This is a, you're kind of shelving your own personal agenda in order to facil facilitate um, collaboration. Um, I, I do like the idea of trying to get um, multiple teacher input in a way that's manageable for teachers. Teachers already have a full-time job. Um, and uh, and already you know volunteer a lot of their time for our schools. Um, so, but uh, uh, one common theme I heard from uh, former members of the building committee is that that educational vision of what's going to happen in the building is really critical to uh, uh, to the best kind of building design. And so, when you talk about the dual language program, you talk about building blocks and aims and ILC and uh, what's going on with project based learning at at Wildwood, all these specific things that you want to have supported in the building, you know, that, that information and how that affects the space really comes from teachers. And yet you can't have you know, 13 teachers <laughs> on the committee. And so, um, so this idea of having sort of a, a cohort, a, a group of teachers who can meet regularly and provide input, I think is, is, a, really good, um, is a really good idea. Um, and the, the other last kind of wonky um, bit of feedback that sounded um, that made a lot of sense to me is having someone with um, past experience of of the process of actually building something, um, whether that's uh, 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 someone with planning experience, but just um, you know, if if it's your first go around of interacting with engineers and architects, it's not that you have to have all that uh, expertise knowledge yourself, but you know, what questions do you ask a project manager when you are at the at this particular stage of the educational vision, what what questions do you ask the architect when you're going into full schematic design? All those sorts of things that you might not think of. Um, so, so, someone with some uh, uh, experience in, in municipal uh, projects like that, I think, would be uh, would be really helpful. Um, and and I, uh, you, you you both stated at the very beginning, but I do think it would help to be just just very clear and matter of fact that this is um, you know we need everyone on the committee to be supporting a, a one building solution. And that doesn't mean that it's um, being prescriptive about how we achieve that one building solution, but, um, but we had uh, a lot of work from a unanimous school committee and town council to support the statement of interest that we're gonna take care of both of these buildings in five to seven years. And that seems like a pretty uh, achievable core principle that everybody should be asked to uh, express their, their viewpoint on if, if they want to participate in this committee. So. Um, yeah, that's all, that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Ms. Spitzer, do you have anything to add? No, I'd like to just say thank you for working on this. I, I guess my question was, you mentioned one out of many potential subgroups. I know that we have constraints, or correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe, again, I don't know, access the packet, but um, I believe we have constraints about who needs to be on it. So in some ways, this question of size is driven um, by the requirements of the state process. Um, but did you discuss any other potential subgroups? Because I, well, I agree outreach and engagement are core to getting anything achieved. If we don't have good foundations for what they're asking people to outreach and engage about, then um, anyways. So 
what are the other potential subgroups that you were considering, if any? Um, I, I think uh, your observation that um, was exactly what we were building off of was mm -hmm. that, that so much of it is prescribed. Um, and so what we were looking at is, uh, so within that, um, what, would we, what would we add to that, right? Yeah. So, um, and sort of, and, and the idea of subgroups was really more to, if we can't find sort of the, you know, a handful of unicorns that have, that can hit five of the required mm -hmm. profiles um, on the building committee, that it's okay to go a little bit bigger so long as we're looking at it as sort of like, how do we make that effective to Mr. Demling's earlier point of how do you, how do you operate effectively with a very large group of people? So it was, it was sort of a proposal or an idea of how that could work if we can't somehow pull together volunteers that meet multiple of those sort of profile contingents uh, requirements. Yep. And so I would just, I like to say I support that idea, especially having worked on the enrollment working group. I think one of the advantages of it is that we were able to meet in small groups at a time that was convenient to maybe four or five people instead of trying to find a time that was convenient to 20 to 30 right. people. And um, one of the things that I'm, I don't see a good solution to but concerns me about this process is knowing that you know, not everybody's going to be able to find childcare or have the means to put aside, you know, however many hours of time this is going to require. So I think to the extent that we can try to lower some of those barriers, even just a little bit, it's worth doing um, because it's going to impact so many families in our town and particularly families of young children who are those who are the least able to kind of find the time to join a committee like this. So I think whatever we can do to try to get their voices heard is really important. Um, so I just might thank you. And I think if we can push that all further in trying to make this accessible to those with small children or other things that get in the way of them being able to be present at these meetings would be useful. Thank you. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was just going to add that, uh, like, the more opportunities we have for attendance, because that, that was one thing I would kind of looked at just recently was attendance numbers from previous school building committee meetings. But, yeah, the more opportunities we have for people to attend more often, the better off I think we are. It's kind of where I'm at. Okay. Anything more to... And do that. Well, I think what um, what we can do as a as a next step is is sort of compile all of this um, feedback uh, and conversation into a single document that we can then um, share with with the town manager um, uh, as sort of our thought process on uh, school uh, school building committee composition. Good. Okay. So. Now, moving on to item H, the process for filling vacancies in elected bodies of the town. Um, so the purpose of tonight's uh, conversation is a discussion of the proposed process, which we do have a slight revision, um, a revised document that we received from the town council president. Um, I will point out that uh, Ms. Griesmer is in the audience um, uh, and is prepared to answer any questions that may arise on the on this process that I may not be able to answer. Um, so thank you. Um, I believe, um, I don't believe that the, that the revised draft made it into the packet and because we don't have printed packets, we don't have that. Um, I think, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Griesmer, the only change in the revision was the dates is that correct? So the, the item that's in our, in the packet, published packet, yep. Packet includes um, some revisions to both the uh, timeline, mostly in the way of detail, not in the way of dates. Um, except for the possibility of moving to the 28th for the second meeting. Um, the 
other thing it does include is changes in the process and just, you know, again, it's tinkering. It's not huge. It's more clarification um, and also then changes in the draft announcement. Mm -hmm. It's uh, critical that we release the draft announcement tomorrow. Uh, we're hoping to do that on or around 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, and the... Um, let me just step back and say a lot of this was developed using, first of all, the charter and also the uh, state law, as well as prior practice of the select board, uh, much of which is similar to the way the charter describes it. What the charter doesn't do is provide an enormous amount of um, detail about the process, like when what gets mailed and that kind of thing. And um, what we wanted to do was provide as much as possible a full month for people to submit their letters of interest. Uh, and then uh, besides that, uh, and have time for committee and the joint committee. And we don't know how many candidates until we see. It's, you know, it's a huge number, then we may have to do interviews over two nights. If it's not a huge number, then we do interviews one night, and then hopefully gather briefly another two nights. Um, another night. Um, and another night and actually make the decision. So in, in what we received in our packets were several items um, that were helpfully outlined in the cover memo. Um, so there is a draft timeline um, and for filling the vacancy, um, a draft process for filling that vacancy, and the announcement, which as Ms. Griesmer pointed out, we do um, need to publish uh, tomorrow morning. Um, so the timeline, I apologize, I don't have the in front of me, I don't have the 150 feet. I think it's before where you. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. There. Okay. So. Um, we are, this, this process has been discussed at town council, so this is our opportunity to provide input on, on this timeline. Um, as pre being presented here, um, we are discussing this today here as a group. Um, any uh, suggestion, the, the announcement that we'll also review will be published tomorrow. Um, and the, we will be developing questions as a committee. Um, every, every committee member on the school committee as well as separately the town council will have the opportunity to suggest interview questions by sending them to the school committee chair and the council president um, by next week. At our next school committee meeting on the 17th, we will discuss the questions um, and finalize those questions at that meeting. Um, candidates will have until, is that the 31st, is that the correct date? Yes. yes, okay. March 31st is the date that candidates must submit their letters of interest. It, they, they're, um, they are confined to one page, <laughs> um, eight and a half by 11, 12 point font, um, and we really ask that they, um, tool their response to the set of responsibilities that you'll have up later. Mm -hmm. um, so they will submit their statement of interest by that deadline. Those statements of interest will be compiled and assembled into packets for the special joint meeting, um, and at which time we'll be able to review those candidate statements. Um, and then we are planning to meet on the 14th, um, so we will need, pending that, di that date, we will be rescheduling the previously scheduled Amherst School Committee meeting, which is right now scheduled for that date. So in place of that 
Amherst School Committee meeting, we will have the special joint meeting with the town council um, to hear from the individual candidates and ask the questions that we've previously discussed and approved. So and then, you are actually looking at the um, previous schedule so that after Tuesday the 14th, uh, we're also say, saying Tuesday the 28th, at this point is the special meeting. I am polling to see if there's any way to move that up, but I won't know that until 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. But right now it's the 28th. Okay. Mr. Demling. So yeah, um, so I have half a dozen details to, and this is just my point of view of some little tweaks. I understand the really tight deadline. And first, I want to thank uh, our chair and, and President Griesmer for coordinating and scheduling this. Scheduling a meeting with 17 people <laughs> is a Herculean task of people who already have busy municipal schedules. Um, and um, I would just echo what Ms. Griesmer said earlier, which is the town charter is clear that it's a joint vote of the town council and school committee. But beyond that, it's very little identified in terms of other than general timeline about process. Um, and so, you know, this, this is how democracy happens. You know, it's very messy. And when it's transparent, it's on the fly and it changes and there's drafts. And um, I appreciate the opportunity for input. Um, so, you know, if, if you hear my input, and you consider it and decide to go the different direction. That's, that's cool, that's fine. I appreciate the effort that you're making uh, as joint chairs to, to gather input from both of our boards. Um, so, so that being said, um, so just on a real detail level, I think after the statement of interests are received by the town clerk and then uh, she confirms that they're uh, eligible based on that they're voters, um, I think at that point the, the statement of interests uh, and the people who have applied to be candidates should be made public. Um, I think just for transparency and for public accessibility, that would be desirable. Uh, and there's, there's no re reason that I can see to wait until the, the meeting packets come out um, a week and a half or so later. Um, I think it would be good. Um, I understand that there are OML challenges to this, but I think it would be good if there was some number, even if it's a couple, of um, questions that are unannounced and that are uh, not known beforehand. Um, I think there are, are many different ways to get to know uh, candidates uh, as you're evaluating them for, for office, uh, for, your, for your vote, uh, to represent the public. Uh, prepared marks are definitely one way to do that. I think unprepared mar remarks and uh, you know, responding on the fly reveals another aspect of, uh, of candidates. Um, I've seen that in town elections. So, um, and you know, I, would be, I would be fine um, if, if those were you know, just one or two questions that the chairs um, uh, talked amongst themselves and, you know, we're, we're, you're not violating any open meeting law by, by, by doing that. Um, I think you might want to strike the resumes may be included but not required. Um, I think if, if you're just In the of, latest edition. Okay, it's not in the latest edition. Okay, we good. Are not yep. accepting resumes. Okay, I was going to say, uh, if you start to get ambiguous with the input format and length, then you just open yourself up to a lot of Complications, but you didn't, so great. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, there was something in there about a recess that has having to be called. Um, I think recesses are totally a fine option from the joint uh, boards at any time. You know, that's just standard Robert's rules of order. Um, I, don't, I don't see a need to require that by policy. Um, you know, it certainly would be an option for anybody to call that at any time, so I think, I think that would be a more flexible way to define it, but um, it's not a, something I feel that strongly about. Um, and uh, I think clarifying for the public, because I didn't quite understand it on my first reading, what um, absences and abstentions at the meeting do not affect this requirement means. Um, so if everybody shows up, there's 17 people, so a majority of that would be uh, nine. And so if 15 people show up and one person, you know, so just clarifying that uh, at the beginning, I think, I think would be really important um, for, for public awareness that the, about what, what to expect as the, as the vote goes forward. And we've done that in, this, in the new memo. Okay. The bottom line is the number's nine no matter what. Hey, you, you, you're thinking like, we have an open spot on school committee, Ms. Griesmer, if you, uh, <laughs> you're thinking like a school committee member. Um, um, and, and that's all I had for now. Um, I, I think the scheduling, is, you know, it's this balancing act between we want to get this position filled because we want representation on a full committee, uh, and yet we don't want to rush it. We want to give people time to see what 
the process is, what they have to input, um, think about whether they want to take something like this on. And, um, and so I, I appreciate the, the, those two principles that you're, you're both um, ma trying to manage in the schedule. So thank you for your work. Can I just ask a favor? Um, I realize I didn't send it to schoolcommittee.org. I sent it to each of you. And so it didn't get posted. But can you make sure it gets posted post your meeting as part of your packet tonight? Okay, thank so. you. Yep. This is actually a it, this it's is an in amendment the of what was in the packet for the council uh, pre, at our most recent meeting. On, not on exactly. It's 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 because it got done yesterday at the last minute because of input I was getting. But I'll be glad to make sure you have it. Okay. Any other, Mr. Harrington? Yeah, I just had a question regarding the timeline. Um, so in, in the charter, it's uh, section 4.1C. Does it say that we have 45 days from the, the point of the vacancy to fill the, the position? Because my math Actually, is like 58 days. Within that 45 days, the president of the council has to set a meeting, but the meeting does not have to be within 45 days. You have to announce the vacancy as soon as possible, and uh, Eric's resignation is effective essentially today because it was effective yesterday, but it's a holiday, so it's the second. And the only reason we waited till tomorrow to announce is because your school committee was postponed last week. Otherwise, we would have tried to put the announcement out today. So we're trying to get the announcement out the first meeting is within the 45 days, but really there's two different requirements. One is how we do, how we fill all the boards except for the council, and then section 2.2 .2 of the charter actually speaks to filling the council. And in the council situation, you must fill the position within 45 days. But just to clarify, the, the, the charter requires that the meeting be called within 45 days, the meeting itself also does not need to necessarily happen in those 45 days. That's correct. That makes or, sense. or so I have been told by legal counsel. <laughs> Any other comments or on the process or the question? Were you looking for any feedback on the um, statement of responsibilities? Uh, separate. Yes, separate that, agenda that's item. That's separate, yeah. and really, we're asking the. <laughs> and school. that was um, drafted by. That's to be drafted by us. So exactly. <laughs> oh, I see. It's I. Okay. Yep. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, when I first met with your chair, we tried to identify four or five different places where, you know, given the fact that this is a school committee position, not a council position, that the school committee really had a chance to kind of put itself forward both in uh, the statement of responsibilities, the questions, uh, stating your preferences first if you want to, those kinds of things, okay? Okay. Good. Are we good? Okay. Thank you for um, that feedback, and thank you for answering questions, Ms. Griezer. Um So moving on to the next agenda item, the... Um, is, is the uh, draft of the school committee responsibilities and expectations, and as mentioned, this is to be drafted by, um, by us, um, and I uh, took the liberty of, of starting that draft so that tonight we are editing and providing feedback on that um, as opposed to drafting from scratch. So that, yeah, let's keep going. Okay, um, so this, um, in doing this, modeled after other examples of descriptions that um, both the current town council, OCA, I think is the name of that group, 
um, has been using um, for just describing just generally what are what are the requirements, how often does it meet, where does it meet, what are the expectations, so that candidates before they put put their names in the in the hat, so to speak, have an awareness of what the commitment is and what the expectations are for participation on on this committee. Um, so. This is separate from any conversation about selection criteria, um, which we do have an opportunity to develop as well as, as sort of put, put forth sort of a framework by which we as a committee are going to be looking at candidates. And we will look at that at our March 17th meeting. But for tonight, and because we, this does need to be published alongside the announcement of the vacancy and the process for filling that, we did want to tackle this tonight. Um, so I'll just give a brief overview. I'm sh not sure how in detail, but basically it's just a very brief description. How many of us are there? What is our terms? Um, I think in the announcement it does make the clarification. I wrote this more to be generic as opposed to specific to this um, one. I think this will be also helpful for future candidates running for the standard election also to have. That would have been helpful to know all of this um, going into this ourselves, I think. Um, the, so I did not put that this particular term will end on our next election, which is November 2021. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so links to the website for more description, description of when our meetings are, that our regular meetings are on Tuesdays. Um, clarification and explanation that there are two separate committees. So while being appointed to the Amherst Committee, this individual will also automatically become member of the Region School Committee um, and what is the expectation and meeting schedule for that. Clarifying that you will be on TV and recorded on video um, at these meetings, as well as an indication of what additional meetings outside of our regular meetings that we are expected to participate in. Um, so the four towns uh, budget meetings, um, which are Saturday mornings, so that I called that out in specific because it's not a Tuesday evening, as well as the various subcommittees, task forces, or working groups that we um, typically um, are volunteering for um, in addition to our regular meetings. Um, the process section is intended to be, um, to describe just generally how we do our work um, and how much work there might be in between meetings. Um, and then just a, a brief outline of the primary duties of the school committee in terms of clarifying sort of what, what are we expected um, to weigh in on. Um, primarily budget and superintendent evaluation, hiring and evaluation, as well as facilitating this, the two-way communication between the community and the district and the schools. So as I mentioned, this is just a draft, so um, open to additions, edits, changes, deletions from the committee. Mr. Demling. Uh, yeah, I think you did a really good job on this. I, I like the fact that thematically it's a description of time and job duty responsibilities and not like a value statement. Um, I mean, I'm sure we all have our individual feelings about why we're doing this and, you know, what we're what the actual engagement is in the, in the broader sense, but that, this is very specific and factual, um, so I like that, like that structuring. Um, just a few minor wordsmiths um, suggestions. Um, under the meetings that the committee meets one Tuesday per month and that the regional school committee meets, I would just add typically meets. Yeah, here we are meeting on a Monday with another <laughs> meeting ahead yes. of us. Um, but uh, we, you know, we, we definitely have our, our, our non-regular uh, meeting schedules that, that come up unexpectedly. Um, under process, where it says work between meetings is typically limited to uh, reading materials provided by the superintendent or district staff, I would just change is typically limited to to includes. Um, I find sometimes, based on some of the other things that are mentioned here, that my time between meetings uh, is, is often more taken up with, with other aspects of the, of the role than it is just, just, just the reading. Um, and then the, the other word tweak I had was that the, the last sentence in the process section, um, members must deliberate in compliance with the open meeting law, which requires that all deliberations about committee business must be held at a posted meeting. Um, I would add all the deliberations among a quorum. Mm -hmm. um, so there are certainly non-quorum discussions that 
is perfectly okay uh, and sometimes productive to take place. Um, so that, I would just clarify that. It's probably all I would say about open meeting law that you could go on for another right. <laughs> three pages about open meeting law. Um, uh, but yeah, but other than that, I, I like I like the I like the d dispassionate uh, factual organization of information. Great, Ms. Spitzer. So I guess my feeling after reading this was that it somewhat understates the time commitment, and I don't know if we should be open about that. I mean. We sh I think we should be more open about that. So mm -hmm. um, I know your edits were at inserting things like typically, but I mean, it's 9 o'clock. I've never been out of a meeting by 8.30. I don't think I have. Maybe somebody grew. So I, I, I don't, I mean, maybe it was like start at 6 and don't bother giving an end yep. time. <laughs> um, and, and I would endorse all of the edits that, um, that Mr. Dumbling made. You may want to insert something about um, being willing to you need to be willing to do the charting the course training and open meeting law training. I mean, there are a few trainings that we do get along the way um, that I would want anybody who takes this role be willing to participate in. Um, I don't know if it's worth mentioning that we typically don't meet over the summer. Um, I mean, I know we have the late August meeting sometimes and we do have a retreat, but maybe you say meetings are reduced outside of the school year, or, or I don't know how to phrase it, but you may mm -hmm. want to add that. Mr. Harrington? Uh, regarding time commitment, I had like a point of order question. Are we supposed to vote on staying after yeah, two and a half right. hours? Yes. yes, thank you. Do I hear a motion? I move to extend our meeting. Well, we're gonna have to do this again in five minutes, but we should follow the policy. I move to extend our meeting a half an hour past the scheduled time to 9.10. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify 4-0. Thank you. And then in five minutes, we'll do it again. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, on the time commitment, would, so um, I agree that, um, that like, I, I like that suggestion to just indicate the start time. Does the committee feel it would be helpful to put sort of a range or estimated number of hours per month or week um, to this to get to Ms. Spitzer's point. Mr. Demling. It's a really interesting topic. Um, I think in order to, to stay along the sort of factual dispassionate route, we, we could add something like um, the Amherst School Committee meets one Tuesday per month scheduled 6 to 8.30 from, uh, in the town hall room from uh, September through, through June. Um, Beyond that, you know, I mean, I've seen both while I've been on the committee and before, I've seen people approach this role very differently. And I'm, I'm trying not to say this in a positive or negative fashion, but some members put in, have put in uh, a lot less and a lot fewer hours than the average member. And I'm, I'm, it's not a good or a bad thing. And because it's not a requirement in Mass General Law or in the school committee law or on the town charter, uh, it's, it's what you make of it, right? And so if somebody has an extremely busy life but they want to serve on school committee and they are not, they don't approach it in that, expecting to contribute a lot in that regard, I guess I don't want to, to put that in the, in the job description. Even though if I were to informally talk about it, I would certainly share my experience that yes, outside of the meetings, you know, it, depending on how you approach it, this can be quite a large time, time commitment. Um, so yeah, that's my own thought. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, Ed? I'd agree with Peter that we shouldn't be putting a number of hours on the position. Good. Okay. Very good. I will. Oh. Well, Mr. yeah, I, I sort of had a question, like, kind of like building on that, piggybacking on that, like, as far as I see it, there's, there's a great deal of preparation time as well that I don't know if that's worth mentioning in there, as far as time commitment. Yeah. Ms. Spitzer? I feel like you cover that in reviewing the materials, because in terms of preparation, it's reading over the agenda packet ahead of time. I mean, we could say potentially, 
Is there other preparation that you were thinking of? Well, yeah, kind of. Um, I don't know if it's like just like a personal process, but like going over the, the packet kind of usually sends me down multiple rabbit holes, and I imagine it's the same for everyone else. But Might I, um, would the committee be, uh, so we have an edit under process work between meetings includes reading materials provided, et cetera. Um, maybe um, reading materials and um, related research. content research. Right. Mr. Demling? Or instead of in preparation for and other preparations for That's an upcoming good. meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be going for a long walk in the sunset and contemplating like school that. choice policy, you know, like we all tend to do weekly. That's good. Yep. And other preparation for an upcoming meeting. Excellent. I will make these edits tonight and get them over to Ms. Griesmer in the morning. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Um, I move to extend our meeting an additional 30 minutes to 9.40. A second. All those in favor, please signal by raising your hand. 4-0. Thank you. We are actually on our final um, uh, agenda item, I believe. Yes, agenda planning. Um, I'm going to guess that that was uh, page 144, I think. So for our March 17th meeting, um, we have the budget vote. Um, we uh, are coming back to our enrollment policy and that will be a vote, school choice vote. Um, MSBA, we have a very packed schedule and we've also added um, charter tuition accounting, which I think would make sense to have on the 17th, um, if um, given that we'll be talking about and finalizing the budget at that point. Um, and I, I believe there was another question that we were going to come back on on that. Um, school choice accounting, I think, was the other one. The, uh, Mr. Demling? Do vote on the dual language policy. Yes, that's, that's up there. So we have votes on the, on the budget, dual language enrollment, school choice. Um, we will also be adding to that the um, discussion and, agree and a alignment on the questions for the vacancy process um, candidates as well as um, our selection criteria for, for that process. So those will also be on the March 17th meeting. Um, is there, without Dr. Morris's aid, I'm not sure how lengthy some of these other topics would be, but I'm wondering if we want to suggest options for moving some of those to April 14th. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I mean, just the, um, the candidates that look like they might not be so time urgent it might be the, uh, the garden program. Um, by the way, all these items I'm looking forward to. I'm not saying they're not uh, priority, but uh, garden priority, uh, garden program, uh, Wildwood SIP update for school committee and report cards. Um, I mean, I would defer to the chair uh, and consult the superintendent about which is, uh, you know, better associated with the schedule. Yep. Um, Sounds good. Um, and the, the other thing, too, is as, as mentioned, we will need to reschedule, most likely uh, reschedule the April 14th meeting to another date. So we'll um, work on getting a doodle poll out for rescheduling that once we have final confirmation that our special joint meeting will actually be on the 14th. Ms. Spitzer, did you have another ad? Yeah. Mr. Demling? So um, I would love to get a, a, a good presentation slash update on breakfast after the bell expansion implementation. I feel like this is something we talked about yeah. more than a year ago, and I don't feel like we've gotten that much of an update on potential plans. This, this is a complicated topic, but um, for facilities issues and whatnot, but um, it would be before, particularly before we end the school year, to get some sort of uh, ball rolling on that, I think would be great. Yep. But obviously not for March 17th. <laughs> okay. Anything 
Any other additional comments? No? Okay. Um, and gifts. moving on, we have a couple gifts. Does anybody want to read? Ms. Spitzer? I move to accept the following gifts from Rachel and Nathan Green, number 144, to support Crocker Farm Snacks for grade one in the amount of $100, and from Anonymous by credit card um, to support the purchase of one Gopher Play Star front mount basketball hoop um, in the amount of $80.05 for a total of $180.05. Is there a second? Second. Moving in second. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. Four zero, thank you. And one more motion. I move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> so moved. All those in favor? Four zero, thank you. We're adjourned.